feeling good too. I should yeah. put this guy on Do Not Actually, hold on. Before I put it on Do Not Disturb, I should open up today's story. <laughs> it may be. Why does that have to happen? There's just like, I don't even know if I'm in the right account on my Google Docs oh. thing right now. So we're just kind of, like I'm not. <laughs> there it is. Um, no. I'm like the House of Kalk. Oh, right. Okay, that's from, <laughs> that's from Jumbo. Nope, that's the Journal of Victorian Culture. Good, good. Found it. Good. Found it. Good. Okay. Good. Hi. Hello. Hello. That's Maya Warner. And that's Grant Thomas. And we haven't done that in like six months. You didn't actually introduce me, though. You just said my name. And that's Maya Warner. Does she need more of an introduction? <laughs> Videographer, co-host, the hot one. <laughs> Grant, the personality. <laughs> did it say hot? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have a great personality. I have, uh, yeah, I do. I do. And a type, yeah. but that's fine. Uh, anyways, <laughs> hi. Hello. Good evening. How yep. are you? Great. Oh, I'm going to make this chair taller. I'm also adjusting a little, so that's fun. We both got started after kind of doing like a little hand dance around yeah. the table, and then we were like, oh, oh, no, 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 this no, isn't no, right. No, 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 so sorry. <laughs> Anyways, um, hi, friend. It's been a frozen little hellscape. Oh, my God. In yeah, we, we were behind from recording. Le- we were behind recording after the holidays, and. Um, we had this this grand plan to get back on schedule, and Colorado said no. We were supposed to record twice this week, and mm-hmm. then it was uh, I, it didn't get above freezing for no. like six days. And that first day it was like, oh, it's super cold, but it'll be fine tomorrow. And then the next day was even colder, and then also snow. And then the third day was somehow even colder, and then it like still got warmer, but it was still. High yeah. of twenty eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was ridiculous. I was making soup, staring out my kitchen window when your text came in, and it was like, "So, how are you feeling about today?" And I was like, oh my God, "I'm not leaving this house." <laughs> I was like, "Like, yes, I want to record because of my type A ass, but um, if I were in Grant's shoes, I would not be leaving my home." If I, if, if I were Grant and had to cross half the metro yeah, to no. get downtown, no. no, 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 no. And I got the two. I was like, I think she's probably excited to record, but yeah. also at the same time i think she like understands and now there's soup in the mix i, know, so I was very jealous about the soup it was solid it was really good soup yeah. i am absolutely i don't i think it's like an irish peasant brain that's happening right now i just keep making too much soup and then freezing it so today i came home and i was like you know what sounds good soup and then and <laughs> pulled it out just of slid thing. it into a cast iron because i uh Saved too much uh, the first That's time fair. around and just had a real. Oh, actually, <laughs> it was the cheddar broccoli from a couple of weeks Damn ago. It. I want that, it. And it's I now, want it. It is all gone. It also took me like 30 minutes of scrubbing my new cast iron pot oh. to get it all out. But yeah. Abby got me a Christmas gift and it's a little <gasps> cast iron over there. She didn't realize that it was a cast iron and that cast irons require care. She got it. She got it for me. And this is really sweet because I said I love pizookies. <laughs> What are pizookies? They're like cookies that you like bake in the Oh, skillet thing. cookies. Yeah, skillet yeah, like cookies, okay, and okay, then okay. you top with ice cream. Yeah. And Does that sh- a name that's not just like Texas Roadhouse presents sizzling gas fire cookies? I think BJ's calls them pizookies. What's Maybe so that's what I'm funny is that BJ's does not exist in Nebraska. Mm-hmm. And so first time I experienced BJ's was when I moved to California. Yeah. And I was like, God, they even got restaurants called BJ's out here. Well, liberal state, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I went to a BJ's was in Oklahoma. And so I thought that it was, there was another chain that I had really liked that I discovered in Oklahoma called Hideaway Pizza, which is, oh my God, if you live in Oklahoma. <laughs> Freeze it and send it, it to me. It was actually slowly becoming just a pizza podcast. Yeah. Oh pizza my God. The pizza was so good. They had like this pineapple with balsamic vinaigrette. Mm. It was so good. But so I found BJ's after that and was like, well, this is just another Oklahoma thing that I'm never going to see again because I'm never coming back. <laughs> and um, Maya got stationed out there for work. She wasn't like, oh, weird, disappointing vacation to Oklahoma. No. <laughs> she was like out there for work and she's like, I did my tour. I do not have to do that anymore. <laughs> I hired a younger person. Yeah. And then I found out there's BJ's here and I was like, life isn't so bad. <laughs> nice, nice. I love all of that. Yeah. I am still chasing the high I got from the perfect restaurant to ever exist in the entire world. Oh. It was in Monterey, mm-hmm. and I would always get two things. First, their house, um, oh, poutine. Their Ooh. house poutine, so good. Great gravy, huge cheese curds, just saucy fries. Mm-hmm. And the table, the waiter would clear that from the table and then bring me my main, which was a... Um, Bon Me Lamb Burger. 
so you have like the heaviness of the appetizer and then just like the lightness of the main. It was also some like terrible American sin yeah. of cuisine. Oh, of, like, yeah. All of these different cultures coming oh, together. Yeah. And it's in the Monterey Peninsula too. It's like, what are any of us doing here? Amazing dinner though. Absolutely loved it. You just reminded, there was another place by <laughs> where my apartment was in Oklahoma called um, When. Just like. Where? You- Never mind. It's the end of the story. You knew I was going to say something. No, I didn't. Yes, you, how did you not? Because I was thinking when, like, the, the <laughs> like Vietnamese seven, eight name. we into the, Oh, Nguyen? Nguyen? Like, N? It's when. I don't think so. Google it. Okay. Or I'll ask my student whose last name it is tomorrow. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's when. <laughs> but, like, give and take here a little it. bit. This is kind of. <laughs> I mean, the restaurant was spelled oh, yeah. U-Y-E-N. Oh, U-N. I thought you were talking about N-G-U-Y-E-N, which is yes, Nguyen. Yes, but that, like, the restaurant was, like, shortened. It was, like, that, that name, but shortened. Anyway, I think a there's a thing. chance where we could both be right right now. I just need to... I need a video. Someone give me a video. Should I call my student right no. now, just live on the air? Hey, kiddo, I know you got algebra. How to pronounce what is effectively the most common Vietnamese name, a very common name now found all around the world that has its <laughs> origin in Vietnam. But how do you go about pronouncing it? Nguyen. Nguyen. Okay, so we're both wrong. <laughs> <laughs> there are words. There's a sound in there oh, that I don't okay. think my mouth makes. Here's the fun thing, listener. Because I don't know if I'm even talking to you right now. If this lives, it's because Maya's fine with her being wrong, because oh, I fine. also am wrong. 100%. <laughs> that is the only way that that's surviving. Anyway, this Vietnamese restaurant was, like, so close to um, my apartment that, and it was, like, in between my apartment and my gym, right? Okay. And so me and my friend Nick, the one that I mentioned that I learned how to drink whiskey straight with, <laughs> would go there after working out, and they, oh, they had these vermicelli noodles. I think about that a lot. <laughs> Just like anyway. a saucy little rice noodle action happening for you? Or was like it in rice, pho? It, no, it's not in pho. It's like just a noodle, but then it comes with like fish sauce, and then I would get the egg roll one, oh, so it would yeah. come with egg roll. Yeah. <laughs> just, Do you ever so sometimes, good. especially during this season, go, you know, I could go for just a quick little 24-hour body ache mm-hmm. to like warrant staying in bed and ordering so much pho. I get a little excited whenever the weather is really bad because I'm like, that means I have an excuse. I have a reason to not do anything. So here's my life hack. Yeah. Take it or leave it, but you definitely want to take it. When I order on DoorDash pho, right, it comes like all the broth is in a container and then there's a couple containers that has like mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. The, the things you build it with. Yeah. I always build it. Now stay with me. I always build it. In a pot, like in an actual stovetop pot. Okay. And it's still warm, so yeah. I can eat it out of the pot then. But I never, especially when I door dash it, can like knock out a whole thing of fun in one sitting. No. So you just take the whole pot and you put it in the fridge. I know I'm a single man who lives alone. And then. <laughs> <laughs> it could be so much worse, guys. <laughs> Could be really so good. Worse. It's like next to like truffle oil. Like yeah. I'm fine, you know. I'm still gay. Um, and then like three, four hours later, when I've woken up from mm-hmm. like the soup nap, I just pull it right out of the fridge and put it right on the stove and just cook it right then and there. That's how I make miso soup. <laughs> You order it from a pho place. No, eat I half make of it, it put and it then the- put it in the <laughs> fridge in the in the pot. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> <laughs> So yesterday, I wasn't going to share this, but now I am. Oh, God. So yesterday I went to the grocery store. For the first time since, like, January 2nd or 3rd, I did mm-hmm. a big grocery shopping run right at the start of second semester. And I needed, like, it was, like, some kind of medication and, like, body wash. It was, like, mm-hmm. we can't, like, skimp and save for the next two weeks on this. Like, I will smell. Yeah. I need to go. So I was really proud of myself. I only got those two things, the medication and body wash. And a rotisserie chicken. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Which is extra funny because I've been doing vegan January. And so I was like at the store and you walk past the deli and you're like. That smells really good. Oh, 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 oh. And then this is the next thing I know I'm walking around with it in my bag. And so obviously devour it. But I saved the carcass, put that in a pot. Also made a little uh, chicken broth tonight, you know? For it's, your vegan January? Listen, it's, it's fine if it's not vegan, if it's also not wasteful, you know? I'm using all You're parts of the chicken. You're making so many excuses. <laughs> yes, because it's... your fucking high and dry January. <laughs> because, listen, it's about the spirit, not the letter. As I told our friend Tyler, who was vegan for a little bit, and was, like, kind of making it everyone's problem, I looked at him, and this was a couple years ago, yeah. maybe two, I go, hey, 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 champ. 
there's no vegan police. You know, it's way more about just doing your best than it is like really getting it right. So you know? now you're the reason why he points at every sausage we see. He's like, this is vegan, right? And like completely ignores everyone. No, He's I like, tried no. to break. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry. I cut you off. Please tell that again because I am that reason. What is what does our friend who's vegetarian do? Points at any meat on a plate. When we were in Munich, it was always sausages who would be like, is this, is this vegan? Yes. And then ignore everyone while everyone is saying, oh no. And then just eat it. And we're like, no, it's pork beef child. Like it's definitely not <laughs> vegan. And it's like, what? And he's like halfway he's through like, it no. already. <laughs> yeah. Cause I was like, I was like, let me break down the math with you. If you go hardcore vegan mm -hmm. for like seven days and it breaks you, yeah. you had seven vegan meals, yeah. right? Or 14 if you do lunch and dinner, yeah. right? Versus like, well, you know, I can make a couple exceptions, like if I'm at a dinner party or if I'm at a restaurant or if I'm getting body wash and I want a rotisserie chicken, <laughs> like you can make, <laughs> you can make a the couple The classic conundrum that all vegans have dealt with. And if it just kind of scratches that itch and then helps it so much easier to go on, then at, you know, at the end of the month, maybe you haven't eaten vegan four or five, six times, mm -hmm. right? but you've still had over 20, 30 vegan meals. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about it long term, right? It's whatever keeps you in the game. So whatever keeps you in the game. There are no vegan, so please. Funny. And I will not apologize for my rotisserie chicken. I'm not asking it's you gonna to. Make, I'm just going to make fun of you for I it. I can already tell you it's amazing broth. Did you know that? Oh, I know. Because <laughs> everything you cook is probably better than anything I will ever cook. <laughs> okay. You can't just like compliment me like that out of nowhere. I don't cook. We were in the middle of making fun of everyone we know and love. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I have a story. It's not even the story I'm telling tonight, mm -hmm. which again, so excited about. Yeah. I have a little true crime <gasps> story for you, okay? I have one for you. Do you really? I might save it though, because okay. I'll, I'll tell you how I found so it. I'm, I'm gonna toss you this yeah, one, okay? Do it, do it, do it, do it. Okay. So I'm gonna work hard to try to keep things anonymous yes. here. We were at a big, now wait for it, hold on. We were at a big tournament this last weekend. It's a big okay. two day tournament at a school here in town. Uh, I talked to the coaches who like told me this story. They gave me permission to talk about this. Oh They're like, God. where? So we're all above board. Um, they host a really big two-day tournament. It's honestly mm -hmm. the biggest tournament between now and state. And they do a great job running it. It's this big school. I can't say enough about these people. Yeah. One of the things they do is as the tournament wraps up and they like finish using classrooms for competition, mm -hmm. they have their kids go in and put a thank you card and a little basket of candy or things like that. And I'm telling you, it's a huge tournament. So they use all three floors, like all wings of the building. But as you like proceed through the competition, the pool of contestants gets smaller and smaller because naturally you're eliminating people. So like third floor comes offline, second floor comes right. offline, first floor left wing kind of goes offline, right? And as those come offline, the kids go in and check. So this is important okay. to know. The kids are checking the rooms before the tournament's done, like before awards are started. I'm so scared right now. You can start to knock things out. And they, you kind of have like the grunts, the freshmen and sophomores who go in and do a bunch of that stuff. And then you have your like leader team, your juniors and seniors kind of go in and after. just like kind of yeah. quality check it. Yeah. So no, no, we're in the no, last round no. and some of the seniors quietly come back and they're really mad that it looked like third floor, like kind of left wing. Yeah. They didn't do it. They went into all of the rooms. Not a single one of them had a thank you card or a piece of candy. Yeah. And so they like contact the kids that were assigned to do it. And of course they aren't there anymore, but they're like, swear to God we did it. Right. But it's yeah. like, oh, it's freshmen. Like they don't understand how important that is. Like make sure like teachers are still happy yeah. with it. And so those leaders go back up and like put things back up. Yeah. And then the third floor right wing comes down and goes, we actually had the same issue with ours. And so then they send all the captains back to go check all of their rooms. Two floors, all of the wings, not nary a card or a bag of candy. Now what's so insane oh. is that on one of the floors, on one of the wings, the senior leaders had gone in themselves and done it. Yeah. Um, and had triple checked that their doors were locked because they'd heard that some stuff was disappearing. All of them were supposedly behind locked doors, but we have confirmation that at least one of the wings on one of the floors was definitely locked. Yeah. And they all disappeared. 
<laughs> while the tournament is still going on. This is such a good murder mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, one of the things I thought about on the drive here was how I wanted to tell you this Lock story. everything down. We're finding out who did you this right now. You don't understand how close we got to that happening. There's still like 400 people milling <gasps> around. Because obviously, like, the tournament's still proceeding. And if you get knocked out at, like, yeah, the 2 o'clock round. you're done. Right. But the team bus doesn't come till like, 7, so right? So just hanging right, out. you're just yeah. hanging out. So, like, basically, hundreds of people. Everyone is still there. And it's immediately like, well, who done it? Right? Like, they first accuse... The very first natural thing was like, well, who has keys to get in? Yeah. So they're like, was it the custodians? Would the custodians go in and take 30? That's, and then, ins- that's insane. Right. Though. That's the, that yeah. was the first, like, no one's risking their job over a couple yeah. of bags of candy. And also, the custodians are very much aware that there's security cameras everywhere. Yeah. They wouldn't steal it. And even if some of them wanted to steal it, which they don't, they would know they couldn't because they'd be caught on video Also, camera. it's weird to take the cards and the candy. Thank you, right? Yeah. To just take the candy and leave the cards, well, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Like, the teachers are still being thanked. Yeah. And you're getting what you want because it's not like the cards have any money in it or yeah. anything. The cards are handwritten notes from the speech and debate students on in this program, like, thanking the teacher for being so flexible with them That's that so week. cute. I know, and they're fucking stolen. <laughs> And so then it's like, okay, one of the one of the students at this school must secretly have a key to these classrooms, yeah. but that doesn't make any sense either, because if you have a master key to your entire high you're school... You're taking the money, or the computers, right, not, or the iPads, you. or like... The first thing you do is it going to be robbing the debate tournament as it's candy. going on still. Yes, exactly. And so it was like, who, who was able to get into those rooms and... Um, take all the candy and the cards. Did and you then, look at the security footage? So this is the thing. Okay. They find out so late in on Saturday night, there's no admin to be able to access it. And so they don't have any way of accessing the security cameras. Oh my gosh. And then Monday was MLK Day. Yeah. And then Tuesday was a snow day. Yeah. And so I haven't gotten word yet as to what is on the security cameras. A huge question is how are they getting in? I mean, it has to yeah. be one of the students that was entrusted with the keys is secretly doing it. But then how? And like some of those student leaders are like, I put the cards in there myself. I put the candy in there myself. And I know the door is locked. And one student reported, actually, like as we were going through, like checking the rooms, putting candy and the cards down and locking the door in one of the classrooms. And now it feels weird, but it didn't feel weird at the time. In one of the classrooms, there was a fresh pot of coffee that had just been made. <laughs> <laughs> It's like not like it's so inconsequential. Yeah, then it's just like it just gives you the chills a little. You're like, oh, exactly. So, who stole the candy? And and dear listener, I'm so sorry. I don't have an answer. They have not texted me back yet as to like. Will you tell us the answer? Hundred okay. percent. I don't think I'm not, I can live like this. I'm not teasing this out without the intention of like kind of sharing later. Yeah. My my guess is that it was a student who yeah. had access to the key who isn't malicious enough to, like, steal a computer, which might actually qualify as, like, a real crime, but kind of feels candy from two floors of a massive high school is, like, enough of a prize to, like, get away with. But also, like, (laughs) teachers, you know this. High schoolers vape these days. They're not breaking the law for candy. Yeah, it's... (laughs) Especially in Colorado, there's so many other things they'll break the law for <laughs> before candy. It's not even like you can like resell it right. for like a value. Or I anything. brought candy to school before. This was when I was a young teacher. Yeah. Young teachers don't do this. I brought candy to school to be like, this will motivate them. No. 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 The kids who knew what was going on were like, cool, today I get to win candy and embarrass my classmates. <laughs> and the ones who weren't doing well, Knew they probably weren't going to win the candy because Grant was in the classroom with <laughs> young me, right? Was yeah. in the classroom with him. Wasn't a chance to win the candy anyways. And all I was was out $15. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've been motivated by candy since I was like maybe in like third grade or right. something like that. Which then asks the question, who, who steals yeah. two floors of it? From a high school debate tournament. And also, who moves fast enough to be able to get through a massive building like that? Yeah. And then what's also super interesting... They had started to close down some of the rooms on the first yeah. floor, too. Because, again, massive tournament, yeah. massive school, but it was all consolidating. The classrooms on the first floor hadn't been hit yet. 
because the first floor still had people in the hallways because that's where everyone was conjugating at, right? Going to the bathroom. Conjugating. The, that's the word for it. Congregating. Sure, that one too. <laughs> <laughs> what does conjugating mean? <laughs> Isn't it like an illness? <laughs> to conjugate it's like when you do the conjugation of verbs for like when you're learning spanish is or that French. what it, oh conjugated yeah yeah well it explains why i use that word so often <laughs> congregating uh they were congregating we're on the first so floor confident. sure that one too um <laughs> where they were congregating at yeah um those rooms hadn't been hit yet because the coast wasn't clear uh-huh. i think it was probably a team job that was, yeah, that it was more than one yeah. person um, just to be able to move that quickly or at least someone who could like be on the lookout, mm. you know, and like text or call or something like that. Yeah. It has to be someone who knows the tournament well enough to know that the second and third floors were, were going to be empty. So it wasn't like a random like student from the school yeah, who was there that day for whatever else. Around, right. Yeah. Or like there for community service hours or NHS stuff or whatever. Like it had to be someone who was familiar enough with it to know like massive tournament going on. But at this point, no one's going to be on the third floor. Yeah. And also probably not the second unless they're trying to find a private bathroom to poop in, which does happen quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So wow. that's so that's kind of like they the hot buzz right now. We could make a whole movie about that. We could make a podcast. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already imagining like the serial intro music coming in. <laughs> so, anyways, we'll keep you updated. We'll keep you posted. I'm so glad that wow. you enjoyed that. I was afraid I was going to toss this up, and you're going to be like, Grant, I watch real crimes happen on documentaries. No, that this one was so fascinating. <laughs> Um, we have maybe a bit of a doozy tonight. I mean, you guys know because you know exactly how long the podcast was because you can see it on your yeah. little app as it plays. I don't we really don't. know how long this is going to be. Here's a fun story, hmm. dear listener. Uh, Grant's really excited about this episode. He also is aware that this episode is going to be longer than some of his other episodes. And so he moment. was like, I'm going to come early. And I was like, okay. Sure. And earlier today, as I was driving home, I was trying to figure out if I could make the workout or not, because I was like late coming home from work and the workouts at 530 and goes till 615. And I texted him and I was like, Grant would have texted me by now if he's going to be earlier than six. So, yes. yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to ask him when he's coming and that I'll be home at 620. And then he was like, I got home late, later than expected. So I'll be there like 630, 645. And I was like, Perfect. That gives me time to get home, start setting up, shower. I got home. Casey brings down the panels while I'm setting up because we're like, Grant's going to be here soon. Dear listener, he showed up at 7.05. We usually meet at 7. So his <laughs> album coming early, letting me know this several days in advance, was actually, I'm coming on time. Here's the thing. <laughs> it's like a series of dominoes fell. First, my kids just love to be in my room after school because it's like a safe space adult. or whatever. And there's a couch. But yeah. um, so, you know, I was trying to kind of clear out the room at 4.15. I officially left campus at 4.50. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, so that's a, that's a miscalc right there. Yeah. And then it did... It did take the broccoli cheddar longer to de-thaw from the freezer. That I mean, I was like, we're cooking in this cast iron right now. It did take longer than I thought it was going to. So that, and then, you know, I'm eating the soup and I'm adding some stuff. And I was like, oh, all right, I was going to add that one more thing. So I'm like copying and pasting things over. And then I'm like, ate that soup too fast. Okay. <laughs> all right, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's, go. let's get changed. Let's get ready. Let's go. What sweater do I wear? What, what, what have I worn recently? And then next thing you knew, it was 637. And I was like, well, we're going to come just a little bit early. And that's okay. Like, it will still be there before 7. And then I get caught behind a car that goes 15. And you know how when it turns yellow and you can make it, you make it? Yeah. They weren't making it. <laughs> they were not making it twice um and it drove me up to the wall but i was like it's fine they turn and now in the neighborhood and there's like an event going on normally i can park right out front i'm in shorts right now because it's like <laughs> it's like a six step walk and it's that i'm parked three blocks away and i showed up at 702 705 he was he was two minutes away from me jumping on instagram live and making an absolute fool out of him well, your gate too requires me to punch in the code and then real slow like <laughs> open up because again so that added what five seconds there was, to just your a, there was just a lot of obstacles and i got through basically on time and on skate anyway next time grant pulls something like that i am going on instagram live so you turn your notifications when I show up on too early when it's yeah. like 640 you're like what are you doing here and it's like you just spend time with my friend. 
Because it's either it's that, you show up 20 minutes early with no warning, or you're late. Oh, also, you know 100% that's what's going to happen next. I have been yelled at, so you're going to get me an hour before I'm supposed to be there. I will be home. I will be at my workout. And I will Instagram live. I I will figure out how to do an Instagram live. (laughs) And then I will do an Instagram live. If you follow my personal Instagram, you're probably going to see me experimenting on that one first. Okay, Ed, anyways. Anyways. <laughs> Let's get into the Let's story, into shall okay, we? Are we ready for this? Yeah. All right. <gasps> so, do you remember anything from the last time we recorded? The last time was good cop, bad cop, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so, you know a little bit about, like, where we are starting yeah. this, things like that. Normally, I ask you a question. John Wilkes Booth. The answer. <laughs> We're going to be right back after a quick commercial break. (laughs) I'm not going to tell you anything at all. I'm not going to tell you anything at all. I'm going to read this first paragraph, and I'm going to ask if you know this person or not. If you do, dope. Going to keep going. If you don't, dope. Going to keep going. Okay? Uh, It's just, it's fine. I want to read this paragraph for you. Okay? okay? Sitting on his casket in the back of the wagon, bringing him to his own execution. John Brown looks around and observes, quote, this is a beautiful country and did not have the chance to see it before. The year is 1859, and while John Brown's story is coming to an end, America's is just beginning. Tonight, we are going to cover the life and cause of John Brown. I have no idea who that is. So, yes, you will at some point in the story okay. know who it is, and that moment is going to come like thirty minutes to three hours from now. Like it's really <laughs> hard in my own brain to time things. Are you out. sure that I'm going to know who this is? That's such a generic name. I'm I'm aware. Yes, okay. I am sixty-five to seventy-five percent sure you're going to know That's who not this high person enough for is. Me. I'm not going to know. Well, I was. It was higher before you said, "Are you sure I'm going to know this?" And I was like, oh, "Fuck." I mean. I guess, what certain these days? <laughs> <laughs> okay, John Brown. Mm-hmm. Let's hear it. And um, I'm going to come back to that quote. Okay. Uh, which was, word for word. It's a beautiful country here. It's a beautiful country. I did not have the chance to see it before. We're going to come back to that later mm. on in tonight's episode. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, born in Connecticut in the year 1800 and raised in Ohio, John Brown was the child of devout Calvinist, who believed that life on earth was an ongoing trial and that the true believer had to adhere to a strict code of right and wrong or else answer to God. His formative years were defined by an image. When he was 12 years old, Brown witnessed the brutal beating and death of a slave boy, a jarring event that would forever haunt him. So he was born in Connecticut, okay. raised mostly in Ohio, but by parents who absolutely hated the institution of slavery. Yes. And um, will instill that in his son. Are Calvinists a denomination of Christianity? Yes. Okay. Um, kind of, I think they're still around, but they had like yeah. a big time. Yeah. I'm not a great when it comes to history religions in America, but <laughs> well, Calvinists no. were, and it's New England too, so yeah. it's super, I think, more common back there mm. at the time. Um, also, this is kind of like a quick programming note in here. Um, I have a degree in history education. So this is something <laughs> that we have talked about like at conferences and stuff. Other than this sentence right here, you are not going to hear me use the word slaves. You're going to hear me refer to them as enslaved black Americans or the enslaved. Mm, okay. I want to, and this is a like kind of an intention in the history teacher community, I want to make sure we are prioritizing the fact that they are there because they are being subjugated to it, mm, not okay. because they like deserve it or like right. they were rightfully born into it or it's mm-hmm. like a condition of their personality. Right. We were actively enslaving them and then in that enslavement, physically, sexually, mentally, and emotionally abusing them. Yeah, yeah. And we need to make sure that it's an active verb, enslaved, as opposed to just like, mm, they're tall or whatever else. Uh, okay. okay. So I'm going to say that. So I'm never going to refer to them as slaves, things like that. We're going to use um, a bit more specific language. And if you have an issue with that, I don't really care. I have a degree in history education. I'll mess it up like five <laughs> times. It'll be fine. Okay. So John Brown um, grew up mostly in Ohio with his parents, but he goes back to Massachusetts as a young person to become a minister. 
Then he becomes a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> he tries to become a minister. This man is, I mean, this is going to be a theme throughout this yeah. entire episode, like insanely religious, which is not really something that I like generally vibe with. Yeah. In this one instance, serve king. <laughs> and when I say king, I'm sure he would mean Lord of Lord, King of Kings, yes, our so. Lord above Jesus. Um, but he, for reals, in a way that I feel like you rarely see in historical figures, like walks the walk, talks the talk, shoots the shoots like um, he actually lives the <laughs> principles um yeah and then and then some and then some too kind mm. of both in action and word Ooh. um and in crime <laughs> 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 or not crime he's a complicated man who's misunderstood no honestly a misunderstood he, uh, author <laughs> <laughs> he is uh, he's a man not a woman uh, so we, we broke that trend nah. and um yeah, we're going to get into it. Some of you are like, yeah, I know who John Brown is right away. All right, and others down. are like, what is Grant talking about right now? So after... Wait, stop for a second. Mm-hmm. We ha- This reminds me of Toby in the office where he's like talking about <laughs> Michael's decided to like start being HR and like resolving conflicts. And there's a talking head of Toby. You don't hear what the question is. You just see him talk about his past. And he's like, yeah, so I went to like, the I went wanted to become like a monk or whatever for whatever religion he was in and then I met this girl and then I I left so that I and married her so that I could have sex with her and then I joined HR because it was close to where she was (laughs) so no I wouldn't say that HR is my passion (laughs) I want you to know too kind of like for you is an office joke like four paragraphs hell yeah from now I love you (laughs) um so goes off to become a minister obviously devout parents he himself is devout Goes to school to become a minister. Yeah. That doesn't work. He instead becomes a farmer, mm-hmm. and kind of more specifically, like a rancher cattleman. Okay. And marries a woman, moves to northern Pennsylvania, where he runs a small cattle farm and a tannery. And that's mm-hmm. going to get us to our first section, which I have titled "Death, Love, and Ohio, <laughs> 1833." <laughs> So the nice thing about John Brown, amongst the many things that are nice about John Brown, is that he was born in 1800, yeah. which means anytime I give you a year without any math at all, you know you exactly, exactly how, how old he is. is. Love that. So when he's 33, older than I am now, he is <laughs> operating a tannery in Pennsylvania, which is a really important mm-hmm. stop on the Underground Railroad. Okay. Which is not an actual underground railroad for our friends <laughs> who aren't from the U.S. or didn't. I do. I do in school. know that it's not an underground railroad, but every time I hear underground railroad, right. I do envision it underground. It just adds a level of mystique. Well, if it makes you feel better, a lot of the hideouts were underground. Um, <laughs> that does make me feel better. But then you had to kind of go above ground, walk to the next place. There wasn't some massive American subway system. How um, cool would that be? Though? I mean, National Treasure Three. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> I make a joke about that too later in this episode. Yes! <laughs> You're too for two tonight, baby. Take it all from him. <laughs> anyway, so he um, has a family. Oh, hold on. How many kids does he have with this first person? Oh, Jesus. Um, What's happening over here, little lady? I don't know. I don't know why I didn't put it down. I think it's six. He has six children with his first wife That's so many kids. it's an obscene amount but 1832 is a really tough year so he's living up in, in northern pennsylvania at the time 1832 is a really tough year for john brown mm-hmm. um one of his sons dies and then john brown himself falls violently ill which mm-hmm. means he gets way behind on a bunch of his bills and things like that oh, no. and then his wife dies in childbirth and both her and the baby die as a result and so he has lost now no. a one born son, yeah. a second child as it was being born, and his wife. And so he, he just, still has five kids? Uh-huh. Oh, and a tannery and is part of the Underground Railroad. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. So he just kind of picks up and moves back to his old stomping grounds in northeast Ohio okay. and immediately marries someone else. As one does. He marries Mary Ann Day, who by mm-hmm. all accounts really is an OG in this. Okay. Uh, her name then becomes Mary Ann Day Brown. Uh, so. I love <laughs> that trend of where, like, they wouldn't change the name. They just, <laughs> last name becomes middle name. Name, new last name, and then you just keep going. Correct. So it's uh, 1833, which means he's 33. Very good. And Marianne Day is oh, I don't know. 16. Okay. Very good. Literally half his age. Oh, or, was I, I supposed know. to know that? Or were no, you just it was making kind fun of, fun of me? Okay. Um, but it's okay. 
Marianne Day, I think, does seem to love her husband okay. and vibes with his like intense slavery abolition POV mm. on the world. Um, she has letters and correspondence that expresses her love for him, right? Their marriage seems fine. Uh, together, they have 13 more children. <laughs> Your face, yes. They have 13 more children. Six of them would make it to adulthood. See, that... The, the, yeah, I mean, it adds up with yeah. the time, but... Holy but now it's like fuck. 10 to 15 children. Yeah, so now you and then have... like 1920, yeah. if you count all of them who died even when they were super oh young. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, 1836, he moves his family back to northern Ohio, and this is really kind of where things start going. Uh -huh. So he has his wife, he's in the process of making a bunch more children, <laughs> and he continues to be a strong supporter of abolition. Mm -hmm. It's deeply tied to his faith, which is going to be a thing that we see throughout this episode. And then something happens. Uh -oh. Down in Missouri, which isn't all that far away from Ohio, a man by the name of Elijah Parrish Lovejoy is murdered. <gasps> see, Elijah Parrish Lovejoy lived in Missouri, which allowed the institution of slavery, but there were people in Missouri who didn't like it, but it right. was a slave state, but not like a tried and true, like maybe Georgia and Mississippi. It's a complicated place. It was a newer state at the time, yeah. right? And so Elijah Parrish Lovejoy moves down there, basically buys a bunch of, bunch of printing presses and starts running newspapers that oh. are anti-slavery. That is also why a that. white mob hunts him down oh, and burns him alive no. in his own barn, oh, no. along with some of his printing stuff. <gasps> Um, there's a couple other things too. Wait, that, sorry. Go ahead. What did at the beginning of the story, the little like shindig he did where he was mm -hmm. on his casket? Uh -huh. What state was that in? It was in the state of Virginia. Okay, cool. Was that a clue for you? No, I just I oh, okay. I just wanted to see if it was yeah. still in Ohio or not. John Brown was executed in, in the state of Virginia. Okay, cool. at the time. For those of you who are on YouTube, <laughs> Mo, I don't Mo has been standing in between us like this whole time, and I don't know what her deal is, but she is very cozy right She's now. Been, in my she lap. was very affectionate when I came in. Every time yeah. I looked at her, her mouth was just open and she was staring at me. I was like, "Love you too, girl." I think she's a little <laughs> cold, maybe, and she mm. she needs her sweatshirt, but I'm not getting up to get it. So, um, so Elijah Parrish Lovejoy is murdered in Missouri, essentially for being anti-slavery, mm -hmm. and he had worked hard to spread the word of abolition and was really well connected in abolition circles, right. circles that John Brown was starting to run in. Okay. So Elijah Parrish Lovejoy's death absolutely rocks John Brown. Yeah. And then basically that next Sunday at church, John Brown stands up in one of the pews. He's not the pastor or anything. He's just a parishioner, stands up in one of the pews and says this, quote, here before God in the presence of these witnesses from this time on, I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. Oh. And if you've ever heard a man make a promise, I get it. I get <laughs> Sure, who hasn't heard that before? I'd love you to meet my mom. Pfft, whatever, right? Have you seen the TikTok of the guy who volunteers to help uh, firefighters like practice emergency Ooh. situations? He's like a 100% straight man and he you have to go into like a building and they tell you where to go and they put like a, a necklace around you that's and with like a piece of paper hanging from it that says what oh, happened, what, injury like, you have? what injury you have and that tells them how to deal with you and a firefighter comes up to him he's like I'm gonna get you out of here and throws him yes. over his shoulder and he's yes. like and I've never been the same <laughs> I feel different <laughs> exactly. exactly so if you've ever experienced anyone else yeah. um a lot of a lot of guys make promises sometimes mm -hmm. it even sounds like they really mean it and they don't. No. And we're foolish for continuing to believe them. But we do. <laughs> John Brown is the exception that proves the rule. When this man says, I consecrate my rest, the rest of my life, to the destruction of the institution of slavery, he, uh, that's an active verb, babes. He 100% yeah. means it. Um, and so as he kind of turns his focuses to that, the rest of his life kind of, <laughs> once falls again, to the falls apart. <laughs> yes. Um, so he's so dedicated to the cause of abolition, but the next decade isn't going to be kind to him. No. Several of his farms and businesses go under, not because of the abolition work, or at least that's not what any of the sources said. Yeah. I just think maybe John Brown was a... a a very average farmer, maybe a below average businessman. <laughs> and we all have our own strengths, yes, you know? Yes, yes. Um, 
but everything kind of falls apart on him. And at one point, he has to go to a judge who the judge declares John Brown bankrupt. So say it with me now. I declare bankruptcy! bankruptcy! (laughs) And there's your joke from the office. (laughs) And so... What a good episode. John Brown doesn't really have a reason to stay in northern Ohio. Mm -hmm. Maybe actually has a couple of good reasons to leave. Leave, yeah. And so he decides to leave to go back to Massachusetts, a place where he grew up close to and he went to school to become a minister. He specifically moves to Springfield, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And this is the next chapter, back to Springfield, Massachusetts, 1846. Ooh, so he's 46 years old. Correct. (laughs) Really middle age. Of course, still having babies, but real middle (laughs) age. His last child, at least that I could find like a record of, will be born a decade after this move. Why? Why? I don't know. Why? <laughs> Monet remember, is my first and well, last. It's important to remember too. His wife is seventeen years younger than him. I mean, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that does make sense. Um, so while it's eighteen forty-six and he's forty-six, his wife is twenty-nine. Oh my god! Yeah. So he moves the family to Springfield, Massachusetts, and that's where he really starts to get connected with some powerful people in the abolitionist mm-hmm. movements. Do you know? the name of maybe perhaps the most important abolitionist at the time? You do. Abraham Lincoln? Sure, what? not really. Although, complicated <laughs> legacy. That was not the right answer. What? Uh, complicated legacy. Frederick Douglass. Oh, yeah, like yeah. Frederick I couldn't Douglass. have pulled that name out, but I recognize yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, mm-hmm. uh, Harriet Tubman, who's more active involved in like helping yeah. enslaved people escape. Um, but she's obviously part of the abolition movement, too. Mm-hmm. And then there's a bunch of pastors, ministers, things like that, who feel called by this. And then you have a bunch of Northeastern New Englanders who are wealthy, who are now funding the abolition movement. It has gone from something that people hold personally to an active political movement. And John Brown falls right into the midst of it all. Here's mm-hmm. this white man from a, at the time, western state of Pennsylvania and Ohio, like a farmer. Um, And a lot of northerners, especially middle class northerners, did not want the institution of slavery to end for the same Mm. racist rhetoric we hear now. They didn't want enslaved, formerly enslaved black Americans moving up north and taking their jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's some racism elements to it, too. But at least initially on the surface, there's a lot of economic arguments. Did you hear uh, Chris Christie's resignation speech? Or the speech that he... Was he still running? He was still running up until, like, last week. It's that moment from The Grinch. (laughs) Are you two still living? (laughs) (laughs) I had no idea he was still running. What did he say? His speech was actually really good. If you have a chance to, like, listen to it, I was just, like, I was working, and it just came on, like, in the middle of the day, so I got to listen to it. But it was, like... Shockingly, I was not expecting it from him, but okay. it was actually like shockingly, like well spoken yeah. and very much like level headed. And he made a lot of like direct quips at DeSantis mm. and Nikki Haley, which was funny because everyone before <laughs> he gave his speech was like, he might endorse someone. We don't think he will, but mm. he might. En- I don't think he's going to endorse a no. goddamn person. No, 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 no. But his, his little quip at Nikki Haley was. We have not, like, America is so divided today. We have not been this divided since the Civil War, which we all know was caused by slavery. (laughs) Yes. Everyone was like, nice. (laughs) (laughs) No endorsement. Couple digs there. Uh, Chelsea Handler presented at some award show this week. I forget which. But she goes, Margot Robbie, wow. Has anyone looked better or more powerful in heels? Yes. Other than Ron DeSantis. Yes! Because you know that, that whole so conspiracy, good. right? Yes, I and did see that. He was just walking around in like little little boot heels yes. trying to make him look taller. It's so funny that she did that after Joe Coy's Yes. Thing. Listen, the bar was really low that you kind of assumed she was going to hit it anyways. Oh, but yeah, she, she managed... won it. She skyrocketed Crazy what one it. day you can do when it comes to comedy. Yeah. You don't even need 10. But who are we? <laughs> who are we to say anything at all? We're not comedians. We're not. We're not. What do we know? I mean... We give a wonderful dinner party. We do. But, oh, one of the people I'm talking to online on one of those little apps right now <laughs> is like, oh, I'm sorry. I've just never actually met someone who's gone to a dinner party before. I'm sorry. Who are you? Right. I'm trying not to view that as a red flag on him. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. 
is. Yeah, a little. I mean, Mason and Abby, to be fair, I don't think had either. And then we hosted one, and they were like, "This is the superior this way to drink." This is the best way to do anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm very much trying not to be like, "I could show you the world." I could show you the world. <laughs> Wonderful. I, just, I know it's like you. There we go. Thank you. I'm just gonna do the background song. It sounds. On this magic carpet ride. Singing podcast. If you've hit plus 15 like three times, we don't blame you. We hate you, but we don't blame you. We are hurt a little bit. So John Brown's working to end Slave 3. Yes, yes, yes. Love the little, yeah. Monet has given you all kinds of side eye over here. It's really funny. Um, what's also crazy is how much of this I typed up, like not even copied. And so why am I struggling to read it? It's always um, impressive to me that you managed to like actually type like full <laughs> sentences because mine are it's like, ha ha, anonymous, <laughs> did cool shit. Bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. No, I'm a narrative. But that's because you're an Excel girl it's and I'm true. a Google Docs boy. That make, does, listen, those are two makes shirts. a lot of sense. Next merch line. Yeah. Um, so he meets... Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth. He also starts to become really familiar with William Lloyd Garrison. This man is absolutely walking the walk. In Springfield, he is not a wealthy man. Mm -hmm. Talking about John Brown. Yeah. He is a kind of, again, back in the sheep wool agricultural business. And things are not great for him economically. And he has a lot of mouths to feed, too. Mm -hmm. He's still a dedicated abolitionist. Despite the, like, economic reasons, a lot of, a lot of white middle-class northerners used at the time to oppose the ending of slavery. Mm -hmm. And so it's up there that he kind of gets connected to this whole network of wealthy people looking to fund abolitionist movements and causes. And what's kind of cool about John Brown is he never seems to try to use these connections to personally enrich himself. I think... One of the reasons why he kind of lives on a farm for basically his entire life, or yeah. his family does, I think it's kind of like, you can grow your own food, right? Cool, I'm off to do other work. <laughs> Bye. A little bit, that's like definitely the vibe I get. So, this next guy section, I had to section it because there's so much stuff going on. What is she looking at? I, don't, I have no idea. She's really, Herself? She's really invested in something. What are you looking at? I'm so scared right now. Is there a ghost in here? No idea. So this next section I like to call Come and Take It and Fuck You Too. Nice. 1850. So this is a 50-year-old man. Okay. How dedicated is John Brown? This family's moving all the time, yeah. usually after terrible economic situations. In 1850, a new law is passed called the Fugitive Slave Act, which essentially said, if you are an enslaved person in a state that allows yeah. slavery, your condition does not change, mm. even if you are physically in a free state. So if you yeah. escape slavery in Tennessee, you can still be captured in New York and legally brought back to slavery in yeah, Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And not only are you, is that allowed, but it basically kind of compelled local law enforcement to do that, to turn the runaway uh, enslaved person back Turning over to... Turning citizens against each other? Exactly. Crazy. Wow, Texas. <laughs> wow. It's almost like you're living in the 1800s. <laughs> Part of me is like, oh, it's a bit more political than usual today. And it's like, oh, maybe because America has never once fixed any of its any underlying problems political ever. problems ever. So you're right, but this connection of wealthy abolitionists are looking to do something about it. Nice. So, um, I love money in the right places. See, I love money for my politics. Yeah, right? that's so good. I'm not corrupted by any of it, no, right? No, 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 and no. And it's no, just no. money well spent. Um, <laughs> Oh, I have a whole note about, okay, we're going to have to circle back to that in a second. So John Brown is having none of this, quote, return black Americans back to enslavement business and starts his own militia in northern New York. Nice. See, up in northern New York, uh, specifically close to a town called North Elba, a man by the name of Garrett Smith had founded a community called Timbuktu. Timbuktu, I know, I know. <laughs> Bro. I know. <laughs> Especially when you find out what Timbuktu is for. Oh, no. Timbuktu will give free land to any runaway enslaved person. You escaped okay. enslavement and have truly nothing to your name. Come to Timbuktu, Timbuktu, where there will be land given to you by Garrett Smith and a mad man named John Brown with an armed militia who will shoot on sight anyone who tries to bring you back to enslavement. See, see, see I hate men. 
Sometimes <laughs> the exception to the rule. I hate men. I hate guns. I hate money and politics, except when it's guns, money from my <laughs> politics. <laughs> like it's becoming like a bigger and bigger issue. Also, side note to all of this, and you'll listen to this later when we go to edit it. Whenever I, edit I don't this. know if we're going to keep this part or not. Okay. But so this like this kind of gets to the modern political issue today of sanctuary cities. Mm-hmm. around immigration policy. Right. So a lot of cities, including our home city of Denver, yeah. has changed the way some, like, smaller crimes yeah. are coded to, like, right. prevent people from having to go through, like, the FBI database or whatever, which will then, like, trigger, like, oh, this person is eligible for deportation and immigration will come get them. Oh. So it won't ping them in that way. That's one aspect of sanctuary. So it'll just go through, like, the state government right. instead? Right. Like, if you get, like, a traffic violation, oh, okay. the FBI is not pinging that. Okay. And so some cities have reclassified some nonviolent crimes so that way they don't get pinged. Okay. okay. And then yeah. also another element of sanctuary city is, let's say you get pulled over for, like, drunk driving. That's not good. That's a crime. We can't mm-hmm. de-escalate that. You're going to get pinged in the system, yeah. right? Um, if you get pinged in the system and immigration's like, hey, can you hold Maya until tomorrow so we can swing <laughs> by and pick her Please up? Please don't. Right. Yeah. Sanctuary cities won't. Mm-hmm. They will release you as soon as you are eligible to be released, mm-hmm. and they will not hold you, which they are in- yeah. allowed to do, but they will not hold you longer for immigration to come pick you up. Right. And so yeah, it's actually insane how like kind of modern this issue is. Yeah. And then this is the thing that I wasn't sure if we're going to keep or not. I still don't know. At least about once or twice a year, the students will ask, in like a fairly nonchalant way, like what I would do if immigration showed up, like at the mm. campus or things like that. We have a oh. very large and wonderful community of immigrants. Yeah. Um, who are they themselves, first generation Americans, or immigrants themselves to this country? And yeah. it's an issue that they are super concerned about. Yeah. And I'm always like, one, and I realize this might be a privileged position, like, I don't think they're going to show up at the school. I don't yeah. think that's going to be a decision I have to make. But two, it's like, you know, you know, we'll lock the doors, we'll eat the snacks in the snack drawer, and we're just going to hang out, right? <laughs> Wait for Anderson Cooper to show up, right? Like, Hell we'll, yeah! We'll make a thing of it. Listen, I know how dangerous those poor windows are over there. Yeah. They're not climbing through that. We just got to barricade the one door. <laughs> it's a coffin I spend forever in. My classroom, no, I love it. It's great. <laughs> and so there's this issue of, like, how can you protect the bodies of these formerly enslaved people. And John right. Brown's like, well, with a gun. A gun. I mean, effective. Around this time, John Brown develops his first nickname, which mm-hmm. I love, called the 44 caliber abolitionist. Still don't know. Who he is. That's no. fine. Okay. I don't, that wasn't going to be a name okay. that triggers you. You just looked me very intensely Because well, 44 in the caliber uh, abolitionist is such a dope ass That's nickname really cool. to have. Yeah. It's the shoot first, bury the enslavers later kind of question. <laughs> when it sounds comes like to a rapper's name, you know? Oh. Yeah. Find us on Simon Cloud. <laughs> Hamilton part two? <laughs> Not throwing away this shot. Bam! And, then, hey! and another person who thinks they own legal rights over another human's body <laughs> dies. Uh-huh. Maybe it's time for political <laughs> violence, violence against my enemies. That song is what made this a singing podcast. You know that, right? <laughs> that and Reba. <laughs> <laughs> God, all the keywords happening right now. Okay, so that's what John is. They're making a life for themselves. Yeah. And for the most part, North Elba, which is really close to the community of Timbuktu, North Elba is where, for the most part, the Brown family will kind of set up camp for Basically, the rest of John Brown's life. Sorry, where is Timbuktu again? Uh, North Elba and Timbuktu is in, as I could find out, northern New York. Okay, okay. So, 1854. So, John Brown is 54 years old at this point. (laughs) A new law gets passed called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Does Mm, that ring any bells? Yes, yeah. Do you want to take a a stab at it? I remember there's, like, a lot of violence, right? Hey! Yeah. Yeah, do you know who is part of that violence? <laughs> the 44 caliber abolitionist. Nice. The crazed man with his own militia. The one who's dedicated his own life to the ending of slavery. I do John remember Brown. a crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, excellent, I don't think yes. we're actually supposed to say crazy person That's anymore. That's fair. Here's, yeah, probably. Um, he might actually be a, a little uh, psychologically He just kind of like would openly talk to God um, on like mm. horseback, which, uh, Grant, I talk to myself all the time, but usually not on a horse, surrounded to buy all of my sons <laughs> as I hunt down Missourians. <laughs> 
but I'm no model for how to live. <laughs> oh um, my god. Isn't there like a really bloody battle at like a creek or something? Or am I thinking of Montana? No, you're Oh, am you're I You're right? on it, babes. You're, what's so funny is you know some of these details, and the thing that like John Brown is known for, you haven't pinged on yet. So that's fun. No, it's great. It's great. I'm excited. I kind of hope our listeners are also like, ooh, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> ooh. What is it? Yeah. It's a real test of like Am I, like, where on the bell curve am I in terms of, like, history, history <laughs> knowledge and our, and our listener base? Anyways, so in 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is passed. Mm -hmm. For our foreign listeners and people who didn't pass U.S. history or forgot some of it, happens to all of us, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was another attempt by our national government to try to address the issue of slavery without really addressing the issue of slavery. There were two territories that had yes. been created and were being governed uh, called Kansas and Nebraska. <laughs> Those territories would later become states, one of which I'm from. And the Kansas-Nebraska Act basically said, oh man, we can't decide if slavery should be we allowed might, in these yeah. places or not. So we are going to just kind of let the people there decide. High five, team. <laughs> all right, solved it. Um, <laughs> and by that, they mean solve nothing at all whatsoever. Just wipe their hands of it. Yeah, like for as long as they could, which was like a day yeah. from the looks of it all. Yeah. That concept was called popular sovereignty, mm -hmm. where the individuals get a chance to vote on whether or not others have rights, much like the Marriage Equality Act movements <laughs> of the 2010s, and now abortion rights. But it's <laughs> yeah, fun. That's really fun. Um, so talking about Kansas and Nebraska, Obviously, I'm going to talk about Nebraska first. <laughs> so, Nebraska was not defined by the Kansas-Nebraska Act in the way Kansas was, which is not to say, I can't all in the middle of talking about slavery, but that is adorable. No, that's staying in. <laughs> you paused long enough. Fuck you. <laughs> Monet just curled herself up right into my lap and is now laying I like, like on my arm. like how we have to like beg Casey to get in the camera, and Mo's like... like is it time for my close right up? Here, real quick. <laughs> oh, you stood up. I'm sorry. Can so, you the issue of slavery never isn't a defining narrative of Nebraska turning from a territory into a state. Right. It was also, fun fact, the first state to become a state after the Civil mm -hmm. War. Um, that's not to say that there was. It wasn't an issue at all in Nebraska, though. And this is right. important, and it's not talked about in Nebraska education the way it should. Mm -hmm. Nebraska education is often like, Haha, we weren't like Kansas, we're better. And then you just kind of move on. <laughs> so I legitimately learned something in researching this article wow. about Nebraska history. There were enslaved people in Nebraska between oh. 10 to 12. So it was... 10 to 12 people? Yes. <laughs> But still, it was 10 to 12 enslaved people. I know, this is just and, such and a 18, small number. I, I wasn't know, expecting I know. it. And that's maybe also why it's not mentioned. Right. But the way it's taught is that, like, there was never once an enslaved person in the never. state of Nebraska. Yeah. Meanwhile, Kansas couldn't get that figured out. And Nebraska's motto, in connection to this, Nebraska's state motto when it was founded in 1867, right. equality before the law. And so it's like, regardless of Damn. what you're going to say, these people are free. That's like a feather in our cap. Used it correctly. Um, <laughs> but there were enslaved people in Nebraska. And in 1860, before the Civil War, there was a slave auction in Nebraska City. Nebraska City sits on the Missouri River, which was an important transportation avenue, corridor, especially before railroads. Mm -hmm. And Nebraska City sits on the Missouri River. This isn't going to shock anyone. Not far away at all from Missouri, which was what? a slave state. <laughs> But Nebraska didn't have the kind of issue that Kansas did. Right. And Nebraska did have a couple of stops on the Underground Railroad right. to help people escape enslavement from further south. But okay. it doesn't get a full free pass. What we're really going to talk about is Kansas. Nice. Kansas was a different story. Kansas, there was going to be a fight. Yeah. And John Brown was going to be a part of that fight. See, white enslavers were coming from Missouri into Kansas mm -hmm. and causing all sorts of havoc to force Kansas to become a slave state. Mm -hmm. What does havoc mean? Um, you get wealthy supporters of slavery from the South Ooh. to pay people to move to Kansas and then mm -hmm. vote the way they want. A lot oh, of these Jesus. individuals, right, a lot of these individuals who come ready to vote for slavery right. in Kansas, they themselves do not enslave any people, okay. right? They don't have enough money to afford something like that. Mm -hmm. But they're willing to vote for it because their backers who financed their move 
want them to. And mm. so that's one of the things these Missourians are doing. The other thing they're doing is uh, murdering and burning down towns that support freedom. Um, I love arson. <laughs> <laughs> they burn, they, they attack Lawrence, Kansas. There's a big one. Oh. I forget the name of the town, but they essentially kind of wipe a whole town off the face of the map <laughs> uh, by like murdering and burning down <laughs> because it was in favor of being a free state, <laughs> free spoilers. Yeah, and so the Missourians were like, we're okay, well then you're gonna die. <laughs> um, and What city are you from? Never, it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> this whole incident gets called the Bleeding Kansas Incident, and is yeah. one of the reasons why Kansas and Missouri, the universities, hate each other. Oh. It's, the rivalry is called very creatively the Border War. And Kansas and Missouri are rivals in basically all sports for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. One of them is this like shared history early on. And in 2007, this is another fun thing I learned. In 2007, Kansas football fans made shirts that said, Kansas, keeping America safe from Missouri since 1854. Stop it. That's hysterical. You don't understand how important this kind of discourse is for me <laughs> as a Nebraskan who grew up looking down at both states, <laughs> but especially Missouri. Missouri, we yeah. We have people from Missouri. Missouri, you're great. I was a silly little kid when I was taught these two things, and I'm sure you've heard both of these phrases, but I want to share two of them with you okay, right now. Okay, 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 okay. I'm so excited. <laughs> you, you cannot trust a person who choose to live in a state of misery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's easy. That's fun. Yeah, That's yeah, wordplay. I love that. The other one is slightly meaner. You could take the bottom row counties of Iowa that border Missouri, give them to Missouri, and raise the IQs of both states. Oh my god! <laughs> this is now that moment where I say, uh, my family regularly vacations in Missouri, especially over the summer. Don't Lake of the Ozarks. keep us out. <laughs> we have a great time. I've said that before. I've talked lovingly about the Ozarks and your cheese grocery store that you have down oh, there. <laughs> um, so John Brown has five sons with him in Kansas. That's the nice thing about having 20 children. Oh, you can field a basketball team or you can field a division. <laughs> or you have a regiment of children who share your last name and who look up to you. Oh man, that's there's just so much in that one statement. <laughs> Like, will they grow up to resent the father, and will that make them racist? Right, 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 right. Uh, you have five sons. Oh, you just dream of one day, like, watch them all play a game of basketball together? John Brown tried to overthrow a state. So <laughs> you tell me how you, you are your dreams. You want you a big family? How big? So, <laughs> very Italian of him. Yeah. Uh, very, very, very <laughs> kidding. Um, so John Brown has five sons already in Kansas. Their names are... Oh, no. John Brown Jr. Okay. Owen, Jason, Frederick, and Salmon. <laughs> no, not Solomon. You're like, Grant, you saw it wrong. No, it's, it's Salmon. I read it on S-A-L-M-O-N. I saw it written that way in three different articles, and then I watched the Showtime series, The Good Lord Bird, which is about John, Bur uh, John Brown. They call him Salmon. It's Salmon in every publication. His name's Salmon. Also, Salmon kind of seemed like he was a dope guy. I'm not going to lie about it. He does some kind of cool stuff later. I feel like his birth certificate was a typo. Like <laughs> That was supposed to be Solomon, yeah. which is biblical. Yeah. And instead it's Salmon, which doesn't make any sense because they... He, he was either born in Ohio or northern New York <laughs> or not... Pennsylvania. That's not Salmon country. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> So five of John Brown's sons are in Kansas at the start of the Bleeding Kansas incident. Mm -hmm. They write back to their father, John Brown, who is in Northern... He literally has a little regiment that he just yes. sent out. Right, because he's still in oh, Northern New York at the start so of all of funny. this. And, you know, John Brown's like, your mother, your siblings, and I are praying for you. And they were like, Dad, we don't need prayers. We need guns. And John Brown was like, well, I can do that. <laughs> so he collects a bunch of guns. This is a, this is a fact. Saw it, several articles. <laughs> Harvest like gets a bunch of guns together, puts them in a box, nails that box shut, labels that box Bibles, and then <laughs> mails it to Kansas. 
<laughs> and then, I'm sorry, doesn't mail it to Kansas, puts it in a wagon, and then brings himself and two more men with him to Kansas. Oh we are up to eight. So, yeah, so he brings guns in a box labeled Bibles, brings his <laughs> sixth son, Oliver, and a son-in-law, Henry Thompson, and they get to Kansas. Now oh there's eight gosh. of them. He's kind of looking to do something with it, yeah. right? So they're trying to support free soilers, trying to end slavery, trying to get the Missourians out of Kansas so Kansas can be a free state. Right. And then in May 1856, a couple of things happen. Like, basically on the same day, pro-slavery forces burn down Lawrence, Kansas, which today is where the University of Kansas is, a, at the time, like, perhaps the leading free city in the state of Kansas. Damn. And then also, on the floor of the U.S. Senate, Charles Sumner, a senator from Massachusetts, Mm. is caned nearly to death by um, a representative from South Carolina. Those both happen basically at the same time. And for John Brown, he's like, perfect, thank you. Now I get to murder people. Oh. <laughs> I'm not... Listen. <laughs> John oh, Brown... Someone almost died? Great. <laughs> well, people died in Lawrence. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was well, violence. In the, and so I think John Brown sees all of that and was like, okay, if it's violence, then it's violence. Say less. Correct. And I'm going to be pretty cavalier here because most of the people he ends up murdering in this next scene yeah. supported enslavement yeah which not that you should be killed for your political beliefs but maybe for that one maybe for that one you should maybe be you should, uh, especially when that's like some an active question about yeah. everything maybe that's too radical if so i'm sorry but john brown basically gets him and his seven sons and son-in-laws and goes around and drags pro slavers out of their homes in the middle of the night and uh, beheads a lot of them oh Okay. Like, does he put him in a box and label it on. Bibles and then <laughs> <laughs> send no. it to the Senate? He executes a bunch of them by a creek, and then ah, um, yeah, I remember that. And then, um, <laughs> and then the U.S. Army starts to come after him because they're, <laughs> they're like, you can't do you can't that. You can't murder people and drag them out of their beds in the middle of the night. Like that's against the law. Oops. So he runs away. Uh, but they managed to capture the U.S. Army, captures two of his sons, uh, Jason and John Brown Jr. Mm-hmm. And there's a huge army force watching them. So naturally, John Brown goes after the U.S. Army <laughs> that had captured his With sons. With his militia Correct. of the kids? I'm not joking. John Brown takes them hostage and forces them to release his two sons. Now, well, reunited, everyone is able to flee. Except... Right. And this is where the oh, first no. kind of like now later tragedy happens. And all of this, uh, Frederick Brown, John, one of John's sons, oh, I it was is be murdered. Salmon. No. <laughs> Do you want to know what happens to Salmon right now? Yeah. Salmon makes it. Oh, Salmon, sweet. Salmon like supports his mom to the very end. Aww, like Houdini. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, great. Also, has a kind of a wild story in Iowa. We're going to get to that. <laughs> okay. Anyways, um... So Brown kills a bunch of them, frees John Jr. and Jason Brown, Mm -hmm. flees, but in all of that action, Frederick Brown dies. And so John Brown kind of goes into into hiding along with all of his sons. And so he's now out of Kansas. And let's go ahead and like take a step back and like look at the scoreboard. (laughs) John Brown murdered a bunch of of pro-slavers, took hostage the U.S. Army, and in the process... Did all of that basically with like eight sons or in laws? <laughs> Lost one of them. That's sad, but that's a pretty strong ratio. If you're looking for like kill for kill kind of action, yeah. obviously the death of his son is a tragedy. It's tragic. But also, cannot emphasize this enough. John Brown goes to Kansas kind of assuming he's going to die. He's like, I'm going to kill as many of these pro slavery mofos as I can until and somebody then else get me. gets me. Yeah. Exactly. And I will have done my bit for God, who <laughs> is demanding I do this. Like, Liam Neeson was motivated because his daughter was gone. Yeah. John Brown John Brown was motivated by God. This was not a man who you could take his religion from. <laughs> and so this next section is titled A Man and a Mission. John Brown leaves Kansas. And mm-hmm. even though one of his sons is dead, yeah. um, Kansas actually kind of teaches him that maybe it is time for political violence <laughs> against my, my enemies. enemies. <laughs> It does not dissuade him that violence is not the answer. If anything, it reaffirms in his own mind and understanding that the only way the institution of slavery will ever come to an end in this country Mm -hmm. is through radical bloodshed until the institution ends. And he intends to be that radical bloodshed. I mean, 
Sure. So he gets <laughs> out of uh, he gets out of Kansas in like 1856, early 1857, yeah. and then he spends the next two years raising money and buying guns. Kansas taught him that violence can end slavery or at least help prevent it, mm -hmm. and reassures him more than ever that those who seek to protect or expand the institution of slavery should be met with death. Hell yeah. So naturally, while a lot of people want to see an end to slavery, few sign up to like full on invade the South, <laughs> <laughs> which is what John Brown is trying to get everyone to do. Okay. But he carries forward with his plan. He gets in touch with a bunch of abolitionists. He's giving speeches. He's raising money. Right. And he kind of comes with a plan, a plan that he never actually writes down on paper because he doesn't want to be exposed, yeah. but talks about extensively okay. and begs Frederick Douglass to join him on mm. before Frederick Douglass says, no, that's crazy. John <laughs> Brown has decided he's going to attack a U.S. Army armory, gather its <gasps> weapons, and hand them to the local enslaved people. I do remember And the this. town he picks, do you remember the name? No. The town he picks is Harper's Ferry. Yeah. We are, we have, for the wow. last hour, I think, I have no idea, hour, maybe <laughs> 18 minutes, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> the, Monday, how long was it? In dog years? <laughs> I like usually. I really have no idea. No, I have no concept. Also, of time. Harper Ferry is kind of like the halfway point of this story. Any nice. questions so far? No. <laughs> and the more and more I did uh, research about this man, the more I was like, "Yeah, this man is cool. <laughs> yeah, this man's an OG." So he, let's take a pause really quick so we can it. change out the battery of the camera. Would you like to get down? You have shed all over me, my dear. I love you so much. Why are you still here? <laughs> I didn't know how to go to that after saying I love you without then diminishing the I love you. I got you. I'm here for yeah. good cop, bad cop right now. Yeah, <laughs> I love you. Bye. Bye. I said I love you. No, I like Say oh, it back. boo. I got him on the HMI. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> or for keeping this or not. <laughs> uh, hum human machine interface. Ooh. Anytime you tell a machine what so to do. So what's so funny is I thought I was like, oh, like this close to get, and then I was, oh, okay, so no, I'm not. I'm, so the buttons work? Is that it or like so what? An HMI like in a factory setting would be like a screen that shows what process it controls. Okay. And then some the operator can so go up to it. So it'll be a screen. <laughs> yeah, with, and press all the buttons. Yeah, so, it's, if, a, so it's a screen. It's a screen. Okay. When the HMI goes down, the process will still run, but no one can control it. So that's what's happening with that. Is Isn't that, that <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Isn't that literally the plot of Disney Channel's made for TV movie Smart House? <laughs> Yes. Okay, cool. It's all an HMI thing. Everything's HTML thing? Yes. Okay. HTML. Good. Good. <laughs> PDF? Yes. Um, <laughs> hi, welcome back. Don't My know space where coding. we're jumping in. That feels like a right like the last five minutes probably is a good thing to say. Yeah, grab. I think I'll start right when I said I love you and then you said why are you still here? That's where we're gonna <laughs> Good. So that way the truth is out. Yeah. I'm the ass between <laughs> the two of us, which actually really is the truth. I <laughs> I've only in private heard you say like nice things about people. <laughs> I'm funny. Uh, <laughs> anyways, so right before that little break. I don't um, know if Grant's hallucinating or not. What? You've never heard me say anything mean about someone in private? Obviously I have, but we're on air right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's staying in. I can't cut that. That's, it's my truth. <laughs> okay, so right before the break. <laughs> So, and this was the joke too. Right before the break, uh, John Brown's like, "I'm gonna steal the Declaration of Independence." <laughs> and by that I mean a huge federal arsenal full of weapons. Hell yeah! So John Brown, private American citizen, wants to invade the South. He's going to use violence to end slavery. He even wrote a new constitution for his efforts that would have ended the Electoral College. Ha! <laughs> And ban swearing in public. Right, that's what's always, like, what's so crazy is this man's like, I'll shoot dead any enslaver, but I'll be damned if you say damn. <laughs> <laughs> I will shoot like a dog anyone who thinks they have a right to another person, and equally, watch your words. Watch <laughs> your mouth. Exactly. There's a lady present. 
This bullet will also be the soap that you wash your mouth with. Hundred percent. This this man, and that's what's what's so fun about John Brown as a character is truly his consistency. Yeah. Right. You it's can like, predict what he's gonna do. When when doing this episode, I at first thought I was teeing off like my next Mary Shelley episode. Yeah. I was like, ooh, we're about people about to get got on this one. And then at the end, I was like, oh, I did another Sylvester Graham. <laughs> <laughs> But unlike Sylvester Graham, who was like, everything's bad, I'm definitely not gay. <laughs> John Brown is like... And we'll push it down, exactly. push it down! <laughs> Remember me by selling alcohol and burgers at my former home. <laughs> Look how fun that episode was. Uh, John Brown doesn't have any of those inconsistencies. He is a man for God who's willing to murder and also thinks you should then watch what you say <laughs> to kind of in general. That's not cool, man. Be you be mother lover. Did you know I am a failed minister? Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I wouldn't say my passion I, is in HR. <laughs> Imagine if John Brown was like, um, a little bit about me, okay, uh, boy dad, uh, um, a follower of Christ, and um, wanted for murder. I don't know, what about you? <laughs> Welcome, so glad to have you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, I want to see all the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. And by that, we mean, I'm going to take the weapons in Harper's Ferry, Virginia, Hell yeah. and give them to the local enslaved population and sympathetic white people. Mm. Um, and we're going to start a revolution. And just let them <laughs> yeah. work it out. So his plan was, as I understood it, mm -hmm. his plan was to seize the weapons in mm -hmm. Harper's Ferry. And the reason why he picks Harper's Ferry and not somewhere else um, is because it is in the mountains of like Pennsylvania, Virginia, uh, Appalachia, but specifically there's a of sub mountain range in Pennsylvania, I think are called like the the Allegheny Mountains, oh. um, and they're mountains that John Brown is kind of familiar with. Okay, and they are super dense and like very narrow passageways. In other words, you can get some armed people up there mm. and kind of hang out up there and be able to pretty easily defend yourself against superior numbers. So his plan is to start this revolution in the mountains, mm -hmm. and then naturally over time, um, enslaved people will escape, join him oh. on this mountaintop, get weapons themselves, and they'll be supported from the north, because it's right on that border between north and south. They'll be supported from like an abolitionist network up north, mm -hmm. and they can kind of funnel guns to them, and it kind of can spread organically. He's not like Sherman March to the Sea. He's like, we're going to kind of start an open insurrection and go from there. It feels like uh, in Avatar when the Navi people start to gather mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know there's just some like old white man in some room somewhere watching them gather and is like, fuck! <laughs> um, that's fun. It's, do you remember is this? what it reminded me of? Mm. During the pandemic, when everything was just kind of unprecedented. Yes. Um, <laughs> every there, single thing. Every single thing, every single day was unprecedented. My friends lived in Seattle, specifically yeah. downtown Seattle, and a neighborhood declared independence and called itself the Chaz. Oh, yes, I remember that. You remember that? that? Yeah. The Capitol Hill Autonomous yes. Zone. Yes. And Fox News coverage was like them breaking into a cheesecake factory. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, I'm standing on the grave of America, and there's like a woman carrying a whole ass cheesecake <laughs> like, behind them. So our good friends, friend of the pod and part of the cinematic universe, yeah. Jacob and Lydia, lived like right next to the Chaz um, during so all of this. So funny. And they just, because again, it's the pandemic, so like everyone has a job, or at least, you know, yeah. in our group, everyone has a job, but no, they didn't. And so they would just take their afternoon stroll every day through Chaz. And they would just talk about it, and they'd get like free flowers and stuff, and they'd turn Kyle Anderson Park into a like community garden there for a little bit and things like that. I love what you said. Yeah. Because for me, I was like, a Chaz. <laughs> They're making a Chaz at the top of a mountain overlooking Harper's Ferry with an intent to kill law enforcement. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, when I I had to visit Seattle for work one time, and at, I was at the plant, and I had like a half day off or something right. before I left, and I was like, yeah, I think I'm gonna go like into the city of Seattle, and they're like, well, where are you gonna go? And I like started telling them about like the, some of the plants I had, and they were like, well, you don't want to go there. That place mm. hasn't been the same since 2020. Right. I was walking through it, and I was like, what do you mean? I will at times hear people say that about Denver. Like, yeah. oh, well, we just had to get out of the city. And I almost want to turn around at times and be like, hey, thank you. <laughs> it's easier to find parking and one-way streets are less dangerous without you down there messing it up. Move, going the wrong direction. <laughs> Every time someone's like, that's a dangerous neighborhood, I'm like, okay, so I'm going to get like a $14 cocktail. There. Yeah. Gotcha. Perfect, cool, perfect, cool, perfect. Cool, cool. Yeah. Oh, it's metered parking? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. That <laughs> It'll be $2. It'll be is that, oh, is it a little tight? I should just kind of fold my mirror in when I park? Great. Fantastic. <laughs> it's walkable. Um, so he wants to form his own Chaz uh, at the top of this mountain kind of running into uh, an insurrection there also low key kind of like the plot of several Star Wars movies mm. is like we're gonna steal the Empire's weapons and then use it to strike back like an Empire like strike, strike back, back kind of moment <laughs> like every single plot of Star Wars is in some way or another the John Brown movie yeah. and also because the very first line I shared that this man gets executed mm -hmm. of course the hero dies in the end you know yeah, I mean that's what that. makes it a compelling story <laughs> so like I said Loki the plot of several um, Star Wars movies here is a quote that someone who knew John Brown said of John Brown that it was like a Star Wars movie? <laughs> yes, in 1859, they're like, yeah, this feels like a fictional universe about lightsabers. <laughs> no, they said this. <laughs> As Moses was raised up and chosen of God to deliver the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, John Brown was fully convinced in his own mind that he was going to be the instrument in the hands of God to affect the emancipation of slaves. So which which trial has he faced was was the frogs? <laughs> His eighth son. <laughs> was it salmon? <laughs> also, it is in that part of the notes that I put, I'm gonna steal the declaration of independence. independence. But I was too excited for the joke, so okay, I jumped cool. again on it. Okay, so um the night of the raid on Harper's Ferry. Mm -hmm. He's gotten some people together. He's gotten some supplies together. He has a plan. He's written bits of it down to give people, but vocally talked about it a lot. Yeah. It's an oral record of what's going yes. on. Um, the night of the raid, his wife, Marianne Day Brown, um, waited at their home up in North Elba, New York, for news about the fate of her husband and sons. He brings like four or five sons with him oh. to the raid, too. Uh, with Marianne Day Brown were her daughters, Ruth, Annie, Sarah, and Ellen, and her daughters-in-law, Martha and Belle, and then Ruth's husband, so one of her uh, son-in-laws, Henry, had been injured earlier oh. working for John Brown, and so he couldn't do the raid himself either. He was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, so thank you for actually hitting on this. Yeah. It's very hard a hundred and what, 60 years yeah. later or whatever. That was quick math. Don't do it for me. Um, <laughs> to try to figure out what the vibe of that whole family, family was, was around yeah. this time. Was it like hell to the yeah, we're doing this? Watch your language. Uh, yeah. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you, Father Brown. Yes, exactly. Or was it that, like, I don't know, our dad kind of scares us, and this is the family business. <laughs> so what else are we going to He's do? He's robbing the Correct. government. And in Marianne Day Brown's defense, yes. um, when she marries John Brown at 16, he is an open abolitionist. Yeah. Like, and it looks like she supported him from the very beginning. Yeah. I don't think there was ever a moment where she was like, don't let someone else kill the Missourians. Like, yeah. she was like, you do it. And you take every single son we've had the last decade with you. <laughs> you do it. You do it. Um, She's like, hey, I don't have to feed yeah. him. <laughs> I think much like John Brown's parents raised him to be yeah. a devout abolitionist, I think him and Mary raised their own children to, be to believe in the cause mm -hmm. in the same way. And John Brown gets the notoriety because he was the leader, very mm -hmm. patriarchal kind of system in the family. Yeah. But it, from what I've read, it wasn't like, and then that was Oliver, the black sheep of the family. <laughs> he was in theater, right? Like, I didn't get <laughs> any of those Well, it's vibes. like one in five is gay, right? Yeah. So it <laughs> has to be one. Girl, yeah, I wish. <laughs> My own personal life, I wish the men I dated one of them. <laughs> I don't know what Sweet. that was. I don't Maybe know. Maybe I shouldn't say this. Say I'll it. cut it. If say not, it. Casey has 
uh, I don't know if I've told you this. Casey's aunt is like a motherfucking saint. I love her dearly. I thought uh, you were going to say lesbian. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, and they had, they always wanted a girl. Okay. And so they, they tried for a kid. They had a boy. They were like, all right, we'll, so we'll try it again. They had four quad, quadruplets. Boys. Wait, so they had one boy, and then they had four, four boys? boys all at once. So now they're at five boys? Yes. We have had this conversation, though, where they're like, it's one in five, right? Who do you think it is? So she has a regiment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. She could help decide popular sovereignty in Kansas. Yes. But, it, like, I think they all just went to college, or I think one went to ROTC or something like that, and there's only one living at home now. So can you imagine going from four, even four boys to one? Your house would smell so much better. <laughs> and be so much quieter. Yes. That was actually the sad moment. Oh, we're just kind of in the moment where yeah. we're sharing things yeah. now. My older sister went off to college, yeah. right? And it was around that time Griffin and I became closer. closer. Mm-hmm. You're not supposed to like your sibling when they're in middle school, no, right? No, no, but no, no. obviously Griffin and I had been your raised Your sibling very isn't similar. supposed to like themselves. Oh, right, ex- yeah. exactly. <laughs> well, when I go off to college, Griffin becomes a sophomore in high school, mm-hmm. and I think he realizes he doesn't love how like quiet the house has been. And it was one of those first moments where like, we're seeing each other as human, where he was like, yeah, no, I just like... And it's quiet around without anybody here. And I was like, Griffin! <laughs> you Griffin! What is this? Aw. Anyways, my dad had a son and a daughter. Yeah. And me, so. <laughs> <laughs> and some other third thing. Uh, and, and the funny one. Yeah. <laughs> Who moved away. The personality. <laughs> as we've said. Uh, still single. So, anyway. <laughs> um, so the night of the raid, uh, Mary and many of their family is up in northern New York at North Elba waiting for news. While the sons and a handful of the son-in-laws, as well as a couple of other um, abolitionist white men and some newly freed or freed black men, take on Harper's Ferry. They run into it all. Hell yeah. And the raid was initially successful. Sorry, they, heck yeah. Heck yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Maya. <laughs> they, uh, the raid was initially successful. They met no resistance entering the town. John Brown's raiders immediately cut the telegraph wires and easily captured the armory, which was defended by one watchman at the time. Oh, that poor man. Yep. They then round up, and I love American history like this, because you always get a sentence like this. Yeah. They then round up several hostages from the nearby farms, including Colonel Lewis Washington, Great grandnephew of George no! Washington. If you're in Virginia and you just grab eight men, one of them is related to George, <laughs> George Washington. Washington during this time period. Like, yes, and we they're all, all named get George to Washington. Sit under our own vine, <laughs> fig tree, okay. and no one shall make them afraid. Griffin, it's quiet up there. <laughs> <laughs> George Washington's going home. Remember that note we got unsolicited that at this yeah. point there's a couple of like too many inside jokes. This oh, is whatever. for us. I don't know what you what. Listen, what are you Grant's doing good at the, the in the moment quips. I'm good at long term callbacks. So I don't know what you want. About fifty percent, thirty percent of the humor is callbacks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so oh, we're gonna get some spicy stuff now. Okay, so they. Um, also spread the news of the rule to the local enslaved population that their liberation was at hand. Now, this is something that's really interesting. Um, Harper's Ferry sits on a railway line, and so they've taken basically the entire town hostage, Mm -hmm. and by cutting the telegraph wires, like, no one can get, like, word out. I mean, you could send someone, like, on a horse or something, but that's going to take forever. How often were they cutting telegraph wires? They did it for Abraham Lincoln's, like, assassination. Listen, like, how? No one could it communicate was like, with each other. Let's shut down all cell phones immediately. Yeah. Right? Okay, so a train comes through. John Brown initially holds it up at gunpoint, and then he's like... <gasps> at gunpoint? Yeah. Well, how do you hold a train at gunpoint? You threaten to shoot the conductor, because it has to slow down anyways, because it's, like, a stop. And then you're like, surprise, we have guns! Liam Neeson, I have a certain sense. <laughs> Skills. And guess, it is free yeah. the enslaved. I'm just thinking of like a guy with like a pistol, like, like aiming it at. <laughs> the train would be like. I'm not entirely sure that that wouldn't have been effective either. It has to slow down because it's entering the yeah, town. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. He holds the train up and then he's like, okay, you get out of here. And the train's like, thank you so much. And <laughs> immediately stops at the next town. And it's like, guys, 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 there's a hostage situation in the town next door. And so they're like, <laughs> Um, uh, box operator, the the ticket master guy, or whatever, at the next town is like, well, I gotta let the local police know, and then the local police let the governor of uh, Virginia know, yeah. and the governor of Virginia is like, well, I better tell the president. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's how President Buchanan finds out. <laughs> Actually, hold on. No, I'm sorry. I think I got that wrong a little bit. The telegraph operator operates his corporate headquarters in Baltimore, and Baltimore lets the Maryland governor know, who's like, will somebody wake up President Buchanan? <laughs> He's very busy being the president everyone forgets when they try to list all the presidents. So real. I forgot that that was. I was like, who can Is he the one that has two non-repeating terms? No, that's Garfield. <laughs> Also one that I don't remember. It's all right. Um, Sorry, let me go get my DoorDash order. Good. I saw him take a photo for a second. I was like, this is terrifying. And then I was like, oh, it's food. It's DoorDash. A DoorDash subway again, guys. She doesn't have a problem. <laughs> this is the first time since the last time. I want you to know you scarred me. I love recording podcasts, and you know that. I am very excited for you to leave. <laughs> you can... Oh, no, because it'll pick up ASMR it'll pick style. Up the, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to I'm not gonna cut anything, but we are getting closer to the end. Okay, perfect. Do you want to, like, check to make sure it's all there? I thought I had more time. Oh, I just have one sandwich, so that's it's there. You door dashed one thing? Yeah. I, or, I order things that come in boxes. <laughs> no, I do that when I'm really hungry. Okay. Well, that's right. I've watched you eat, like, salmon. Yes! Before, just, like, right next to you. I also... I go, we're having different evenings. <laughs> I also got like the the big the big one so that I have lunch tomorrow because I'm bad at. I would just eat a big one now. Would then I, you have to wake up? I mean, I do that too. I have such a weird relationship with food because I'm like, who needs 12 inches of a sandwich at 9:30 p.m. when you have to teach the next day? But I'm like, but silly little fun time. <laughs> this might be saying it too now. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I went to go get my sandwich. Uh, <laughs> Grant went to go talk to his. Men. Say it. Say it. Don't say it. I'm ashamed. <laughs> His online dating people. No, we're not. Okay. And we're back. That was a fun little break. I don't know what got cut. Okay, so initially the raid goes really well. And then... Oh, Casey's about to take the dogs out. We can wait a second. I do feel bad for the editing you will have to do later. Nah, that's fine. Okay. I usually play with... I have, like, a, a puzzle that I bought online now. And then I'll, I'll play with that because it doesn't take any, like... It's like the fidget toy, and I'll yeah. play with that while I listen to the, and then I'll stop and be like, oh, fuck that. I gotta cut, cut that okay. out. <laughs> Back to level 137. Okay. Say you'll remember me. Okay, T. Uh, so anyway, so things are going really well for him until it's not. Yeah. And it's, that starts happening the next morning. Mm. Um, because... Everyone now knows about what's happening yeah. in Harper's Ferry. Yeah. And the Virginia militia shows up, and John Brown's crew kind of puts up a fight. At least one of his sons kills in the sh- is killed in the shootout. Oh, so this is routed. the second son that's now died in second, the last They might even lose a third one okay. here in the situation. Um, John Brown is wounded, but mm. um, lives through the experience. The Virginia militia is led by traitor to the country, Robert E. Lee. Oh, boo. And I'm going to stand on the soapbox for a second. Hear me out for a second. Robert E. Lee shows up to put down the rebellion, which is so deliciously ironic. If he wasn't a war criminal, like it would be yeah. even better. Um, <laughs> Two of Brown's sons are killed in the action, and Brown is captured and then later put on trial. But real quick, Lee was seen as a traitor in his own time. This is not us going back later and like applying like a modern lens on like something that like you had to be in the 1860s to like understand the con- I Lee have to was viewed respect as respect my heritage. Exactly. Lee was viewed as a traitor by the people at the time. How many mothers in the North do you think respected Lee as he led the rebellious South in battle after battle that killed thousands of Northern soldiers? If you add up the casualties on both sides of the Civil War, almost half a million Americans died, and a huge percentage of them died because of Lee's orders or mm. while com- like uh, carrying out actions under yeah. Lee's orders. Boop. He is a traitor to the country and broke the oath he made to the U.S. Constitution Constitution because the state of Virginia chose to secede over singularly the issue of slavery. How do we know Lee was viewed as a traitor in his own time? This is glorious. Robert E. Lee, the traitor to the country, had his family home in Northern Virginia. Yeah. Huge, gigantic mansion. Of course. Do you know what that home is today? I don't know. It's part of Arlington Cemetery. Because Ooh. when the Union Army took over Northern Virginia, they immediately captured Lee's home. And under orders of, I believe, Lincoln, 
buried the dead Union soldiers in the front yard, side yards, backyards, and Rose Gardens of Lee's home. They wanted to make sure, win or lose, he would never be able to return to that home without being haunted by the ghost of the men his treachery killed. And then because so many Union soldiers are buried there, it is now part of Arlington Cemetery, and honest to God, not that far away from the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. He was viewed as a traitor at the time. Yeah. So much so that they buried his victims of his treachery in his yard to ensure he would never be able to return. And good news, he didn't. He was never given back property after the war was done. Also, that is fucking savage as fuck. Oh, I by know, Lincoln. Right? Lincoln hears it and he's like, bury them right there. Yeah. And they're like, what? Well, <laughs> what's also super crucial to understand is from Lee's front yard on a clear day and like with, I mean, a mag- not a magnifying glass, binoculars, yeah. but not super intense ones, you can see Washington, D.C. Lee's family estate overlooked on the other side of the Potomac River, the nation's capital. If you betray the country, you shouldn't be able to get that home back. And I'm so glad that we made sure future generations understood how we were to view that situation Mm -hmm. by burying... Literally making a huge cemetery. Around around. what he did. We're back to the trial. But it's deeply ironic, one, that Robert E. Lee is called to put down a rebellion in Virginia. Yeah, bullshit. That's really funny. Yeah. Two, um, Lee was viewed as a traitor in his own time. Three, it's actually now in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, and this is now Mm. the final really interesting thing. When Virginia leaves the Union and secedes as part of the Civil War, the state itself exits. West Virginia did not exist at the time. It was just Virginia. But people in Western Western Virginia, yeah. on the other side of those mountains, were a lot more impoverished, a lot further removed from Richmond, the center of political capital right. in Virginia, and nowhere near as committed to the cause of slavery as the Virginians were. Mm-hmm. And so West Virginia, the people who lived in Western Virginia, Virginia yeah. asked the U.S. government, hey, could we be our own state and be part of the Union? Oh, that's hilarious. And we said, absolutely you can. And they... <laughs> West Virginia seceded from Virginia because Virginia seceded from America. <laughs> so West Virginia seceded from Virginia to become part of America again. I like West Virginia a lot more right Isn't now. Isn't history so yeah, funny? That's so crazy. <laughs> West Virginia was like... Uh, 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 it's uh, also uh. actually why, really interestingly, um, West Virginia and Virginia have almost always, since its creation, voted very differently oh. politically. So for a really long time, West Virginia, because of its strong like union memberships and blue-collar jobs, right. was a steadfast Democratic supporter yeah. and Virginia, which was more agrarian and had more of this like kind of establishment wealth, right. was like Republican. Right. And then in 2004, West Virginia voted for the Republican, and in 2008, uh, mm. Virginia voted for the Democrat, and they immediately like switched. It makes sense. Isn't that interesting? That's too? crazy. Thank you. Okay. That is very interesting. Back to the story. <laughs> um, John Brown's captured and is injured and is put on trial. Yeah. And people see this trial in 1859 as a huge escalation moment. Mm-hmm. It happens in late 1859, I think September, October, November. I think November is when yeah. the trial begins. Um, Of 1859. I say that because a year later, in November of 1860, Abraham Lincoln will win the presidential election, and two months later, the Civil War has already started. Mm -hmm. Like, we are in closing seconds of Act One of, like, this part of American history. And so America rightfully understands that this is an escalation point. The South basically wants to, like, pull John Brown limb from limb. Right. While the North... While I don't think you can commit open armed assault against a US state, certainly kind of understand what John Brown was trying to accomplish and don't want to see him executed for it. Yeah. There's a lot of people who write letters to the Virginia governor being like, hey, when you find him guilty, because everyone knew You're gonna find Virginia him was gonna find yeah. John Brown guilty. Um, like when you find him guilty, life in prison. Yeah. Like you don't need to execute him. Yeah. But like that's gonna be such an escalation point. But the Virginia governor clearly makes a big deal about it to like show his support for like the Southern cause oh. and things like that. Boo. He makes basically where the trial's taking place and where the prisoners are being killed held like a huge like military base uh, essentially. Ha, ha, ha. The trial gets kind of rushed a little bit, and once he's found guilty, John Brown is um 
sentenced to death as soon as possible. Which Meanwhile, was exactly not super long after this, the Jesse gang, oh, right. or the James gang, <laughs> someone kills Jesse James and then is like pardoned and then someone kills that guy and the sentence is commuted. Right. Also, those guys tried to allegedly kill Abraham Lincoln. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So there's just like a lot of really kind of crazy, and that's what also too, hell? when people are like, America has never been more designed, divided than the Civil War. Mm, that's kind of a gray area. Agree to disagree. Yeah. There's some excellent points, but it's not a perfect analogy. But even if we've never been this divided, we're, I, we're not close to the Civil War. No. And you can tell that because rarely do American politicians get assassinated these days. What? Which isn't to say rarely do people lead armed rebellions against, against the, the government. government. And it's not That's actually would think. kind of occurring more and more frequently. <laughs> it was actually super funny, too. Last one we had, only a couple dozen miles away from Harper's Ferry. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. It's that part of West Virginia that dips really close to the yeah. capital in Maryland and stuff. Anyways, um, so the Virginia governor kind of escalates things. It's gaining national attraction. Um, a big narrative you're seeing in letters to the Virginia governor is sentence him to life in prison, quote, like, for the South's own sake, for the South's good. Uh, because if you kill, kill John him. Brown, yeah. you are going to make a martyr out of, of him. him. Yeah. Because even when John Brown is just fair. in prison, yeah. uh, they kind of have to foil a plot that involved up to a thousand men. We're going to break him out. Yeah. There are people who are like, listen, I'm not going to overthrow the government. That's nuts. But I'll <laughs> absolutely shoot some Southern militia to free John Brown. Yeah. That's the guy that killed all the Missourians. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And we hate Exactly, desserts. exactly. So they had to foil a plot to break him out of jail while the trial is going on. Also, John Brown can't stand at this point. He's like so wounded. He's like kind of carried everywhere, mm -hmm. everywhere on like a plank or a little bed or something like that. Aww. So it's not like, let's get John Brown back up on that horse. Yeah. And it's like, well, maybe he's more of like an intellectual Maybe he can now. like live. Right. He's walked so much of that yeah. walk. Now he can kind of retire to talking the talk <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Rolling the roll. Right. Um, that doesn't happen in part because John Brown's wife does not is not willing to publicly support a jailbreak attempt of him. Mm. Um, there's so much politics happening in between yeah. John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, which also could technically be counted as domestic terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we should say. Um, and uh, his execution. Yeah. Like, for instance, Mary Ann Day Brown yeah. starts to now be coached by a bunch of famous abolitionists around, like, what to say and how to say and how the soon-to-be mm. widow of famous abolitionist John Brown should behave and act and what she should say in the news. Mm. Which, I wouldn't fuck with that. Well, here's a so yes and no. Yes and no. I think in none of the readings did it look like, and Marianne wanted to do it, but John said stay home. Like, I, she, 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 I do not get the vibe mm -hmm. that she, she was, was a public something. figure. Right, that she was forced to do anything. I also do not get the vibe that she was a public fi mm. figure or naturally looking to become a public figure. I think she really was fine, like, supporting and, like, kind of doing her part of the family, which is supporting yeah. the committee of children. They yeah. <laughs> And, like, they have a home up in North Elba, which is, I think, at least kind of important to the community of Timbuktu, which yeah. is doing work of, like, establishing free black communities yeah. in the North. And so I don't think it was great for you to come up and be like, hey, your husband's about to be executed. Here's what we think you should well, say. This generation of PR reps were really on it, <laughs> they man. Were, they were up there. <laughs> yeah. well, because this is also what's kind of crucial, too, to understand about this whole situation. And I don't know if I've gotten to this yet. John Brown does the raid on Harper's Ferry without the support of the abolition movement. Yeah. He spends a really long time begging Frederick Douglass to go to Harper's mm -hmm. Ferry with him. Mm -hmm. And Frederick Douglass is like, that's a suicide <laughs> yeah. mission. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if Frederick Douglass was fully opposed to armed rebellion. I did a lot of research, didn't yeah. have enough time to explore that angle. Yeah. But he was like, John Brown, I'm not going to Harper's Ferry with you. Like this, what you are proposing is an insane thing. And John Brown's like, mm, agree to disagree. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go shoot okay, some people. Well. <laughs> It's See the only thing I'm good at, Dad. <laughs> it's the only thing I'm good at. Today, one of the kids in class said something like so ridiculous that without even looking up from my computer, I go, but Daddy, I love him. <laughs> <laughs>
I just want to remind all the listeners that my room is their safe space. That that was said with like <laughs> with a certain love, level of yeah. agency yeah. and like understanding. Anyways, okay, so now let's get into the trial. Obviously, John Brown understands he's going to be found guilty. Mm-hmm. His closing speech is recorded word for word, and it starts off with basically being like, I've actually had really solid representation, and I thought the trial was more fair than I honestly kind of assumed it was going to be. I don't have anything Clubs, wrong yeah. right, with kind of how it's... Yeah. gone down. And then I have a couple of excerpts from his closing speech because he was actually a really wonderful writer mm-hmm. and religious in a way that I can like kind of deeply respect. And so I want to pull a kind of couple of these quotes. Yeah. This man's speech is in total like maybe six paragraphs and so there's only a handful of lines. Mm-hmm. But he says this. This is now John Brown speaking for John Brown at his trial. Had I so interfered in behalf of the rich the powerful, the intelligent, the so-called great, or on behalf of any of their friends, and suffered and sacrifice what I have already experienced. Um, And every man in this court would have deemed it an act worthy of reward, not punishment. So his opening paragraph is like, y'all mad I did this for people you have enslaved and impoverished. Mm -hmm. But if I did this on behalf of any of you guys, like against the North, you would be celebrating me right now. It's literally (laughs) us. About John Brown. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, later on, he goes on to say this. This court acknowledges, as I suppose, the validity of the law of God. I see a book kissed here, which I suppose to be the Bible, or at least the New Testament, that teaches me that, quote, all things whatsoever I would that man should do to me, I should do even so to him. Matthew 7, 12, basically treat your neighbors the way you want to be treated. Yeah. It teaches me further to, quote, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. Hebrews thirteen three. I endeavored to act upon that instruction. And then towards the end of his speech, he finishes with this. <clears throat> now, if it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the fervorance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood further with the blood of my children and with the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, then I submit. So let it be done. Ooh, wow. This is a man who had lost already three sons to the cause understood he himself was about to pay the price. Mm -hmm. And even in that speech, the last people he talks about are the millions of enslaved black people Mm -hmm. that he was fighting for justice for. It's an insane speech. It's awesome. The trial ends. Brown is found guilty. And most Americans, read, most white Americans feel complicated about it. In the North, they're like, obviously we shouldn't like try to overthrow the government, but what we understand what John Brown was trying to do. Yeah. Leading abolitionists at the time try to tether themselves close to the spirit of John Brown mm-hmm. and distance themselves from, from the, the actions. actions of John yeah. Brown, uh, which is a tough thing to do. And it's all happening as it's clearly escalating, right? Yeah. Like you've had things happening in Kansas. Now you have this thing in Harper's Ferry. Lincoln's going to be, uh, there's going to be an attempted assassination on Lincoln yeah. within a year. He's not even sworn in as president. Yeah. Yet. Like things are clearly escalating around the country. Right. On the morning of his, uh, of his execution, before leaving to get onto the wagon, he says, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this land will never be purged away, but with blood. Ooh. It's like violence or nothing, baby. A little bit, yes. Also, <laughs> remember how like the last episode I did, it was on Jumbo the Elephant? Yeah. And that was fun. But at one point I go, I would just love to hear the words of Jumbo <laughs> right now. I would just love to have a little bit of something <laughs> or another. Dr. Doolittle. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I'm like, what we're really missing right now is the cocaine bear <laughs> side of the story. So it's really nice to have John Brown, who's poetic yeah and a lot of it's recorded yeah also on the jumbo story real quick yeah at that debate tournament where the mysterious candy grab yeah. happened i was talking to a former student who's now comes back and helps judge yeah. and stuff and it's so funny when they make that transition you know it's like nine months have passed right mm-hmm. it's like i judged you in a competition less than a year ago uh-huh. 
but sure, now you're in the judge's lounge and, now and you're we're adults. my friend, I guess. And that's fine. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's endearing and it's funny yeah. and it's part of the growing up process. And that first conversation with them is always so funny. But they were like, Tufts University. And I go, oh, did you know your mascot is Jumbo the <laughs> Elephant? And they go, yeah, and we keep his tail in such and such place. And I go, actually, you keep it in your archives in the <laughs> library. But yeah, basically. <laughs> and that person was like, he knows everything. A little, I think so. <laughs> and part of me is, because obviously I'm not talking about the podcast or anything, mm-hmm. but there's like the strange things we've learned from this endeavor. Yes. But I love it. Okay. Oh, it's so good. I want to go to trivia sometime with you. I feel like you'd... I'm actually so good at trivia. Lydia and I tied, which was insane. Lydia That's and I, fair. with the least amount of education, tied yeah. on the trivia game on the <laughs> New Year's Eve trip. Right? They're masters of science and mathematics all around us. Ironically. And Lydia and I are like, pow, pow, pow. Cheese is ready. Let's play this game. Ironically, <laughs> the final tiebreaker between them <laughs> right. was math. Was math. <laughs> and Lydia and I, I have a question too. Lydia and I had to answer something, and then afterwards we were like so what is a prime, prime number, number I remember hearing that conversation from my little Victorian child I think you actually crawled I out like, just to stare at me for a second I just to watch you guys in. okay okay so never be purged yes. except with blood that's a it's an intense thing to say I hope that's on us too we, I think sometimes have a great way of figuring out that was a little intense let's go ahead and riff for a yeah. second before we come back to it and so And I add this part specifically because of how I think ironic it is. Mm -hmm. The Virginia colonel who executes the execution, who ensures it happens, says this afterwards, quote, So perish all such enemies of Virginia, all such enemies of the Union, all such foes of the human race. This Virginia military colonel says that about John Brown. Also John Brown, famous of enemy the of the race. Union and of the human race. West Virginia's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, Western Virginia's like, like, should we be West yeah, Virginia? Yeah, should, we, <laughs> should we get out? <laughs> hey, listen, this has been weird, right? <laughs> um, Imagine just, if they had seceded from Virginia before this had before all happened. happened. Yeah. Well, actually, so here's what's so funny. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I love it. The curse of my history education degree. <laughs> They wouldn't have been allowed to. Oh, really? In order for a region that's already part of this estate yeah. to become its own, own state, state, it needs permission from the federal government okay. and from the state. Oh, so they needed to do something that would like really separate right. themselves from the state. Right. They, they Actually, if Western Virginia wanted to be its own state, it yeah. would have had to get permission from Virginia yeah. to, be, to do that. And so the reason why they were allowed to do it during the Civil War is because Virginia couldn't be asked for their permission. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's really funny. It's actually, okay. It actually caused a huge issue a hundred years later when someone sued that West Virginia wasn't a state. Why do people sue shit I like don't, that? I don't, I, 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 what do you get? There was like a larger question to it all. I forget what it was exactly, but the question really was like, oh my God. West Virginia became a state without Virginia's approval. Is it allowed to be a state and should it lose representation? <laughs> <laughs> the Supreme Court was like, I'm, 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 yeah. Oh, look right here. Yeah, look, if you look right here, it's fine. Yes, it can't be. The <laughs> anyway, yeah. next. <laughs> so, um, the Virginia colonel was only right about one thing. John Brown was definitely an enemy of Virginia. Yes. Um, and then I also, so I, I want us to take us back to that very opening quote that mm-hmm. John Brown said while sitting on his casket on yeah. his way to the noose. This is a beautiful country. I did not have the chance to see it before. Hmm. And in my mind, and when I also say my mind, I also mean the way Showtime's The Good Lord Bird yes. did it. But I was like, oh, bravo. <laughs> Stealing Stunning. that. But giving yeah. him credit now. He's clearly remarking on like the landscape. Yeah. But because his death happened so close to the start of the Civil War, mm. it allows you to think for a little bit that what John Brown was seeing was like a beautiful country that could exist. Mm. One that he had not yet seen Aww. before. And that he, unfortunately himself, would not live to see. But that his wife and the majority of his children would live to see. And I think that's kind of beautiful, too. 
Wow. So now there's three different sections that I call like the legacy moment. Yeah. So the legacy moment part one. In addition to skirmishing with the traitor Robert E. Lee, Ugh. there were two other really big historical figures at John Brown's execution. Oh my God. Not like involved in some way or like saw him at the train station. Yeah. Who were there the day he was executed. Yeah. The first is uh, Thomas Stonewall Jackson. Terrible nice. rep for Thomas's because he's like a yes. famous Confederate general. The other one, John Wilkes Booth. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> but not in that way. It's like so, it's like a where's Waldo, like, John Wilkes Booth, what are you doing here? Right <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny because like John Wilkes Booth was like a moderately known actor before all of this and like kind of famously from the South. Yeah. Much in the same way that like uh, Angelina Jolie is like famously pretty. Um, <laughs> Like, kind of, like, part of his aesthetic or whatever. And so he was, like, just famous enough for us to kind of track where he was. Like, now we have enough primary and secondary sources to be, like, oh, look at this newspaper being being like, and there was the sage actor Robert E. Lee. Or, sorry, John John Wilkes Booth. (laughs) Not the sage actor Robert E. Lee. I mean, different kind of actor. Um, (laughs) John Wilkes Booth, right? Like, he was just famous, and he had his own journal entry, and everyone was writing crazy letters at the time. Yeah. And so we have enough of a paper trail to kind of place him in places. And we're, like... What were you doing? Are you Doctor Who? Like, what are you doing? All these things? <laughs> How crazy would that be if I know. he was Doctor Who? Um, wow. This next section, is it? Yes, okay. When Brown was hanged in 1859 for his raid in Harper's Ferry, Virginia, many saw him as the harbinger of the future. For Southerners, he was the physical embodiment of all of their fears. Mm. A white man willing to die to end slavery. And the most potent symbol yet of the aggressive northern anti-slavery sentiment that was taking hold. For many northerners, sorry, this is getting annoying. <laughs> For many northerners, he was a prophet of righteousness, bringing down a terrible swift sword against the immorality of slavery and the haughtiness of the southern master class. That was copied and pasted from the American Experience article on John Brown. Pretty, but not my not my language. Not your words. Not my words. <laughs> um, and it did spark things. It yeah. actually sparked sparked a lot of things. Sparted, nice. Sparted. Sparked a lot of things. This is sparted. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, did um, you spart in here? <laughs> shh, 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 shh. We had Chipotle. Shh. <laughs> Almost exactly a year after his execution, <laughs> and then right back. <laughs> Almost exactly a year after his execution, South Carolina would secede from the U.S., officially starting the Civil War. Okay. One or two months after that, a couple of soldiers up in Boston have a comrade <gasps> whose name is John Brown, and they kind of joke with him at first, and then together they write a song titled "John Brown's Body." Oh. Here's some of the lyrics. He captured Harper's Ferry with his 19 men so true. He frightened old Virginia till she trembled through and through. They hanged him for a traitor. They themselves the traitor's crew. His soul goes marching on. Which, of course, inspired another song. Oh. Written by two of his best friends. Okay. Who helped fund a lot of his campaign work and even helped fund a little bit of Harper's Ferry stuff. Yeah. They were part of a group called... um, the Invisible Six, mm. uh, kind of behind the scenes, and they wrote a little ditty called The Battle Hymn of the Republic. Jesus Christ. John Brown's death coined like the spokes song Ugh. of the US military today. <laughs> and there's a certain section that That's is so ironic. directly inspired uh-huh. by John Brown, and it's this section right here. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. And then the chorus is, and you recognize the song, glory, glory, hallelujah. hallelujah." Right. So that's the song that John Brown inspires. The majority of his children will go on to outlive him. He loses two in Harper's Ferry. He loses a third, Frederick, in Kansas. And obviously there's the children that died before they reached adulthood. Uh But afterwards... Most of his children lived on. I have like this huge, long Holy running shit. list yeah. of all of his children that lived kind of oh into God. adulthood. Yeah. One of his children um, moves back to Northern Virginia, maintains his father's legacy, kind of accepts a lot of awards on his father's behalf, becomes a socialist. Um, <laughs> nice. There's a lot of people who kind of maintain that camaraderie and spirit. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about Marianne Day Brown for yeah. a second. 
1864, Mary, some of her daughters, her son Salmon, and some of like their in-laws or whatever, decide that they are going to move, decide they're going to move to California. Nice. Abby's uncle had declared it, quote, to be a land of golden opportunity. I think Abby's Gold? one of the daughter-in-laws. <laughs> mm, okay. So it's like going to go hang out with the in-laws. Um, the land of gold opportunity. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mary and the rest of this crew sold their farms and head west from New York to make their way to California, hoping it would be a fresh start and kind of get them out of John Brown's notoriety. That's fair. Obviously, the community they live in, all it's about John Brown. Uptown. Exactly. In Timbuktu, <laughs> which is a crazy name to name this place. <laughs> um, and then there's an article mm-hmm. that Marianne Day Brown and her children were caught by Confederate sympathizers no. and executed. <gasps> it's only partially true. Ooh, I um, love this. That winter, they are in Iowa yeah. and are discovered by Confederate sympathizers who start to kill some of their animals and actively start to pursue them. And this is what I was able to get. They run away and arrive, what was the name of the fort? They arrive by wagon at the Union Fort of Soda Springs, Idaho, arriving only three hours before their Confederate pursuers were able to catch them. Mm-hmm. From I, from Soda Springs, Idaho, the U.S. Army personally escorts the Brown family to Nevada, where they are then brought to the town of Red Bluff, California. They are immediately welcomed. Salmon gets a job. They're still, because it's still the war. I know. Um, get salmon a gets a job pier? with dolphins. Salmon. Uh, <laughs> Trout, actually. Exactly. Trout, trout, trout. Yeah. Rainbow trout. Rainbow trout. Um, uh, they're still kind of notorious. The Civil War is still going on. They're still kind of being followed by um, yeah. Confederate sympathizers. So they move a couple more times before finally settling in Saratoga. And then I love this. So she's there in 1865. They set up a life there. Her, her daughters, her son Sam, and some other in-laws. And then in 1882, she makes a trip back east. She's honored at by receptions in Chicago and Ka- Kansas and visited several places associated with the life of her late husband. Mm-hmm. While at the house of her son, John Jr. in Ohio, the body that had long been lost <gasps> of her son, Watson, oh. is brought to her. And she gets to take it north to North Elba. Because oh, her son, Watson, was one yeah. of the sons that had died in uh, Harper's Ferry. Okay. And no the body was never recovered. Body, yeah. Well, no one gave them the body. Oh. And I know, at least for the other son, <laughs> this is actually kind of great. So, two sons die in Harper's Ferry. Yeah. Both of their bodies kind of disappear. Her son Watson's body is brought to her in like 1882, or at least yeah. the remains of it, at least. And yeah. she's able to like lay it to rest. The body of the other son is brought to like a local medical college or whatever. And then like the Civil War happens. And then right? the tail is brought to a university. And You're actually kept... not super far I off at all. I hate that. No, you actually, so you kind of actually love the story. Okay. okay. Because Harper's Ferry, all of this is so in, much in North Virginia that it's one of the first places the Union Army invades and like kind of takes control okay. of during the Civil War. Yeah. The Union Army finds out what this college did to the body of John Brown's children and sets it on fire and never reopens the college. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Like they take, I think, the remains that they can identify yeah. and then burn it all down. I have and... a great Am I the Asshole <laughs> relating to this. Shut up, Al. <laughs> oh, you'll see. And so so um, she is able to bury her son Watson up in North Elba in 1882, and then I think returns to California, and two years later, in 1884, mm-hmm. almost 24, 25 years after her John dies, mm. she passes away and is buried Aww. up there. I think of natural causes, surrounded, from what I can tell, by her many children, <laughs> many of whom lived to be like in the 1912s, 1914s. I think the last one died oh in like 1916. Yeah, like your great grandparents could have like hung out with the children of John Brown. That's how close American Civil War and the institution of American slavery is. That's like I know it's really history, crazy. but it's like your great grandparents could have very easily hung out with a person who had active memories of slavery. But yeah. I'm getting off that box. I'm getting off that box. <laughs> and I'm stepping down. <laughs> because this is truly now the last category. Okay. Final thoughts. Okay. Couple things. It would be a huge discredit to turn John Brown into this white savior figure. Yeah. And I hope that's not what I've done yeah. over the course of this last, uh, yeah. however long this is, hour, two hours, I don't think we're at three. Five, Great. probably. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he was deeply moved by his faith, yeah. devoted 
uh, in his faith and devoted to his cause. But a lot of the work that John Brown did was because of the support of famous black abolitionists at the time mm. who heard him, trusted him, yeah. at least in part, and were able to help funnel some resources to him, right? I right. think he, want, he, he was part of the cause. I would make him out to be this other thing. But he sacrificed quite a bit, three sons and then himself yeah. for this cause, and kind of lived entirely in poverty, not because of his abolitionist stuff, but... Because he was focused on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, additionally, though, basically after his death for more than a century, it's really only black Americans who are mm. celebrating John Brown. In white classrooms, textbooks, and in history, John Brown is viewed in the way that we're supposed to view the Confederacy. He was a traitor who assaulted the U.S. Army and tried to kind of do things on his own. And that wasn't good. Like, John Brown, at least when I was learning about him in school, wasn't treated kindly, you know? Yeah. And I get it. Like, he did terrorism. Uh, <laughs> and, like, without trial, did execute some uh, Americans. Yes. Yeah. And inalienable rights means that you don't get to be judge, jury, and executioner. For someone who was very adamant about not cursing, he did commit a lot of sin. The way the good Lord Bird explained it, and I don't know if this was pulled, because the good Lord Bird is a show based off a book, and I don't know how much that author did, did research on it, but yeah. the, here's how the show basically justified it. Mm. John Brown thought lying was not okay. Yeah. But it was okay to lie to people who had rejected Christ um, and were, like, now willingly lying to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, like, if you were dancing with the devil, you can't be the only one playing fair. And so that's why he had no problems lying and executing a lot of them. But also... Oh, I mean... What a hollering good time. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So what he does do is domestic terrorism. Mm -hmm. And he disregards the rights of the people he murdered. Yeah. He drags his family into that business. He, his most infamous act, Harper's Ferry, he does without the support or backing of many of the black abolitionist leaders that he like sought counsel and support from. Yeah. So I want to make sure like that complicated aspect of his is legacy clear. is yeah. clear. At the same time, I don't know if there is a more pure martyr for the idea truly that all men are created equal mm. during this period of American history right. than John Brown. A man who very easily, like an impoverished farmer in a northern state, could have lived his entire life without ever really touching the issue of slavery. Yeah. And instead gave it all for it because he believed truly that God had made him equal to black Americans, to everybody, and that he needed to end any system that would oppress them. Mm. And I think even amongst abolitionists in the North at the time, the idea that all people were created equal, that was controversial. Yeah. And so his legacy is so much cooler than just John Brown Harper Ferry or John Brown domestic terrorist. His <laughs> legacy is cooler and more interesting. And the way he lived his life was a reflection, I think, of a lot of those. He actually held true to a lot of his beliefs, right. whether or not they agreed with the exactly. Bible sometimes, it's, but he, he was consistent. Right. Yeah. He, they all followed the Bible in his own way. And also... Old Testament has a whole bunch of like, and then you murdered everyone to teach them a lesson about smiling. Right? Or, like, <laughs> or like, whatever. Like, Old Testament was very much like, well, I had to kill everyone on earth. No one liked me. Uh, New Testament is That's like, it, I'm not going. Right. <laughs> New Testament is very much like, and then I held an elegant dinner party. Old Testament is like, murder your son, prove it's real. You know? <laughs> It's that's that's not even libel. That's like no, that's, true that's, actual stories yeah, from yeah, the Bible. Yeah. And then Jesus had enough bread and fish for everyone. That's New Testament. Murder your son so I know it's real. That's Old Testament. <laughs> John Brown lived both. Yeah. Um, last thing I'll say, it wasn't until the 1970s that like kind of mainstream attitudes about John Brown began to change when his legacy became fully understood, not just within the communities of black America, but like in America at large. Right. And so when you texted me, this upcoming theme law is and law and disorder. I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. I think you knew your story before I fully oh, grasped probably mine. probably did. And it was a thing, too. I hadn't even really checked that John Brown was on my list. But yeah. it was one of those moments that when you told it, it was like... Done. Like a John Brown bullet through my head. I was like, <laughs> hey. we're going to do John Brown. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> so that's the life legacy of John that. Brown. That's so fun. 
Thank you. Thank you for that opportunity to say it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> two episodes ago, we did Welcome to New York Part 3, Here and There, which was just a series just of silly series little stories. Just just ridiculous shit. Oh, you know what? I, that actually, that reminded me of something, too. <laughs> and then this one was like, I had three snow days to compile a book report on this. <laughs> Here we go. Um, before we sign off on this episode, I realized yes. I have a gift for you, and it's not really a gift. How? You, you do know what it is. I do? We'll find out. You're going to get my honest to God reaction. <gasps> oh my God! Yes, I do. And actually, because I hadn't heard anything about it, I just yeah. kind of assumed so there's a that reason. it was done. So we, g- I'm saving this also for the end for a couple reasons. But we got these jerseys, and they're from a company called Fan Crazes, not Fan Craze. And it was like an influencer thing. Um, but I know. So I'm just appreciating all the detail right now. There's so much detail on it, and. It's like actually, it's it's pretty great. Oh my god, we're gonna have to like get into like a winter sport or something. Like, I know. <gasps> hockey game, hockey game, perfect. Hockey game, done. <laughs> um, Talk about. So the deal so was kind of that we would post like some videos and pictures of us in the thing, and then Fun. we would in the jerseys, and then we would get uh, like a discount code for our listeners and stuff. But upon further examination, I'm not entirely sure this company is legit. So as in like it's gonna steal their credit card information. As in that they might never get whatever product I think they prioritized us because we have like a significant fo- like they reached out to my personal email which is not connected to while I mm. laughed and then I was kind of like do you mean while I laughed and they were like yes thank you yep. <laughs> thank yes, you I yes do. we absolutely did and I, I wasn't to tell you off air. <laughs> I wasn't gonna do it if they asked for any credit card information but they didn't and so that's how we have these jerseys they sent them once, and they went to some ambiguous zip code in South Carolina, and then I oh. emailed them and was like, "That's that zip Listen, code? Listen, you really have us out on a limb there. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that zip code was nowhere in any of the information I gave you. What the hell? And they were like, so sorry, we'll send it. We'll send, like, we'll re- it was an error or something. We'll and send then, new ones. Yeah, so anyway, um, we're not going to <laughs> yeah. give them a discount code because I'm not entirely sure. I think the actual company is Fan Craze, and this one is Fan Crazes. Mm. And so they're emailing me a lot, and I might email them back and be like, give it to me real. <laughs> but anyway, they're, they're really cute. If you're Are not they emailing on... your personal, yeah. can't you just block them? I probably could, yeah. Uh, but they have a... Grant picked my number because I was nervous. You're um, number one. Yeah. <laughs> And then it says, well, I laughed on the front. It has, like, our logo on the, the sleeves and then our, our last names on the back. And they're in uh, navy and gold. Yes. It's not quite well I laughed colors, but it's very close. It's, it's as close as I can yeah. get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love it. So I now we have it. them. Now we have them. <laughs> I'm going to put it on, and I know I'm going to be a little sausage casing right around my like Middle, midsection. Yeah. I'm gonna, that's fine. I'll just oh, wear it with the denim okay. jacket. Yeah. Also, I think you're allowed to be kind of paunchy in a, in a jersey. I'm pretty sure that might be the point. There's yeah. also... So much stitching. This is not going to shock mm-hmm. anyone. No. I never had a jersey before. I don't think... Ever? This is what also kind of makes me think it's fake, because usually it's like, these are, like, ironed on, it's or, like, sleeper. they're not, like, patches sewn on, you it's, know? I'm very excited about it. Oh, yeah. I'm happy there's, that we have There's them. a lot of sewing. There's a lot of sewing. And I don't mean that in a positive way. I don't yeah. mean it in a negative way, but I don't mean it in a positive way. Yeah, it's way. definitely also not like, but it's like well, the fabric's right. nice. Yeah. It is, and it's us. And it's, it's us. It's so us. You, she asked me for what number I wanted, and I had it before she was done sending the text. 24! <laughs> and <laughs> and I was she like, was like, Jesus what the fuck? Christ. I was like, well, I went to a school district that like, you know, average uh, class size was 28, and my last name was Thomas, so I was always 24 on the roster, and so that was my number, 24. Sure. It's my brother's number, I would have been 27, sports. so. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, thank you. Yes. Um, okay. So, pop quiz. What are three things you learned? No, I'm kidding. Could you imagine? <laughs> I have to tell you something off air okay. too because I think it's funny and it happened in class today. Okay. Cool. Um, but thank you all and thank you for hanging yeah. with us. Um, if you would like to support us more, we have oh, yeah. We have Instagrams and TikToks, and if you really want to support us, just watch a bunch of our uh, things on TikTok. That, That'd be cool. That actually does pay us a little bit, or watch us on YouTube. That now pays us. And, and you can find us. <laughs> we're as... at Well I Laughed on basically everything. Uh, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. And if you want to email us, we're well I laughed pod at gmail.com. We've been getting a lot of fan emails. We, and have. we need to we need to do a whole episode. Do something on that with stuff. it, yeah. Yes. Um, and then we're also on Patreon at Well I Laughed Podcast. Thank you all. Yes. Bye. Goodbye.